É, então, vou chamar o Gabriel Godoy para falar, a gente continuar esse debate um pouco do tópico desse ano, que é filosofia política, direito. Gabriel, com a palavra. Boa tarde. Em primeiro lugar, queria é, saudar o Charles, agradecer o convite, dizer que é uma alegria é, estar aqui nesse... É, dia tão bonito para discutir um pouco sobre filosofia política e hospitalidade. Esse tema é um tema muito caro, tema é, dos estudos que eu fiz para a minha tese de doutorado, defendida aqui na Universidade do Estado do Rio de Janeiro. Queria aproveitar para também é, saudar os professores e professoras convidadas, é, dizer que é uma, uma honra participar né, desse evento juntamente é, com vocês, não é sempre que nós temos a chance de conversar com a nossa própria bibliografia, né? então, saudar o professor é, James, a professora Aiten, são professores muito caros para todos os pesquisadores e pesquisadoras que trabalham com o tema da migração e do refúgio, então é uma alegria estar aqui com vocês. E é, é, não posso deixar de fazer menção aqui ao meu nobre colega Marco Formizano, da Unidade Legal Regional, do escritório do Acnur, sediado em São José, da Costa Rica. É uma satisfação é, estar no mesmo evento que o Marco, que sempre é, tem apoiado as atividades é, da rede é, de instituições que integram a Cátedra Sérgio Vieira de Mello, entre elas a Casa de Rui, aqui sob a liderança do Charles, entre outras universidades. Bueno, é, o que eu gostaria de conversar um pouco com vocês é sobre... É, de certa forma, o, o campo é, da fundamentação do direito internacional dos refugiados. Então, eu gostaria de é, fazer um grande salto para trás, para, enfim, retornar um pouco ao pensamento de Kant sobre hospitalidade, como o, o, o mote kantiano e, o, e a abordagem kantiana sobre hospitalidade é retomada pela filosofia política contemporânea, vou fazer um recorte particular em como Jacques Derrida é, revisitou Kant e a partir de então pensar um pouco é, com as inspirações de Derrida sobre é, como discutir hoje algo que poderíamos chamar é, e que eu busquei, é, enfim, é, encaminhar como uma espécie de é, é, possibilidade de uma ética do encontro. Então, esse é um pouco o tema né, da minha tese de doutorado, é, pensar os sujeitos, a política e a ética do encontro. Então, esse é o, é, o, é o objetivo, vou fazer uma fala rápida e fico aberto para as eventuais questões para que nós possamos ter um diálogo sobre, sobre o assunto, se for de interesse de vocês. Então, é, o primeiro ponto é que, é, quando nós é, é, retornamos à obra kantiana, há um, um, um opúsculo político muito interessante é, 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 do século XVIII, em que Kant, né, na, sua, na sua obra A Paz Perpétua, fala um pouco sobre é, é, esse novo campo do direito que ele designou de direito cosmopolita. Então, o campo do direito cosmopolita, né, diferente do, do direito é, é, internacional, que regula a relação entre os Estados, e diferente do direito é, público, que regula a relação do Estado com os indivíduos, o direito cosmopolita é, trata de uma nova configuração de relações, né, da relação do indivíduo com o Estado estrangeiro. Então, é, Kant menciona um pouco esse novo, é, esse novo campo do direito e coloca um tema muito interessante sobre como é, é, os Estados têm que lidar, de certa forma, com os não-cidadãos. Então, essa é uma proposta de pesquisa bastante interessante, que coloca um desafio que permanece, de certa forma, ainda contemporâneo, e toda a discussão sobre é, política cosmopolita retorna hoje com outros é, possíveis encaminhamentos. É, quando Kant pensa um pouco nos, nos princípios para garantir essa, essa, essa paz perpétua, se depara com essa discussão sobre é, o direito cosmopolita, ele faz uma reflexão é, relembrando que é, se há, de certa forma, uma posse é, é, comum da Terra, se habitamos é, de maneira comum a superfície terrestre, de certa forma, 
seria é, é importante é, perceber que existe uma espécie de uma lei universal de hospitalidade. Então, na visão kantiana, dentro desse campo do direito cosmopolita, por habitarmos é, é, esse planeta que nos é comum, é, sobre o qual temos uma espécie de, 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 de propriedade comum, é, não seria possível negar a um estrangeiro é, um direito de visita. Então, é, para o Kant, há uma espécie de um dever geral de hospitalidade, né, uma lei universal de hospitalidade que integra é, esse, esse direito cosmopolita que garante a um estrangeiro, a um não cidadão, poder ser admitido por um outro país né, e ter esse direito de visita. Mas um direito de visita que é um direito que não garante a permanência dessa pessoa. Então é um direito é, de entrada, mas é um direito que tem duas características. Em primeiro lugar, ele é de certa forma temporário e em segundo lugar ele está ainda condicionado à decisão do Estado, que é soberano, para definir a, a condição da própria visita. Então, nós podemos pensar que, de certa forma, se é, 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 para Kant o, a hospitalidade é um direito, de certa forma um dever, é, 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 de outro lado, esse dever não garante a permanência, ele está é, condicionado às decisões é, é, do próprio Estado soberano. De modo que, a hospitalidade kantiana é uma hospitalidade de visitação é, e é uma visitação que não garante permanência. Então, eu faço esse recorte porque, de certa forma, é, o enfoque kantiano ainda parece é, interessante para nós pensarmos o que está na base e no fundamento do próprio direito internacional dos refugiados. Quando nós, quando nós pensamos hoje no que é, na prática, a aplicação do regime de proteção internacional com base na Convenção da ONU de 1951, é, na nossa própria lei interna de refúgio, a Lei 9474 de 97, no limite nós estamos falando né, é, dessa, é, do direito que os sujeitos têm em face do Estado, mas no limite é, a decisão de reconhecimento da condição de refugiado é uma decisão que será tomada é, no limite por um agente que representa a própria decisão do Estado brasileiro. Então, por mais que haja o direito subjetivo do sujeito de solicitar e ser reconhecido como refugiado, no limite, esse reconhecimento está é, é, condicionado também por um procedimento administrativo né, é, é, e que é, culminará com uma decisão do próprio Estado sobre o status e a condição né, daquele sujeito. Então, tá, há toda uma, uma discussão é, interessante, mas que tem, digamos assim, o seu fundamento é, de certa forma, já é, numa perspectiva clássica na obra kantiana do século XVIII. Então, deixo esse recorte e passo para um, um segundo momento. Uma espécie de é, retomada do mote kantiano a partir de uma perspectiva crítica da filosofia política contemporânea. Então, um dos autores é, é, interessantes que revisitaram a questão é, da hospitalidade foi o filósofo francês Jacques Derrida. E Derrida, quando é, retoma a perspectiva kantiana sobre cosmopolitismo e hospitalidade, pensa é, a hospitalidade em outros termos. Né? Porque, é, para Derrida, porque foi muito influenciado é, também pela filosofia e pela ética levinasiana, né, portanto, interpelado pela questão da alteridade por uma outra perspectiva sobre é, como encarar o sujeito, ele faz uma espécie de, de rotação de perspectiva e deixa de fazer uma análise centrada no Estado para pensar uma análise que pudesse tematizar também a situação do próprio sujeito. Então, isso coloca uma questão interessante, porque nos permite discutir a questão da hospitalidade a partir de uma outra mirada. Né? Então, Derrida... É, é, quando pensa a hospitalidade, vai dizer que é, a hospitalidade, é, é, como nos legou Kant, precisaria ser é, é, repensada a partir de uma, uma perspectiva incondicional da hospitalidade. Ou seja, é, a hospitalidade pura, a hospitalidade filosófica, seria diferente da hospitalidade jurídica, da hospitalidade kantiana, porque, para Derrida, 
o acolhimento do outro, ele só faz sentido se ele acontecer de maneira incondicional, né? sem impor nenhuma condição, sem colocar nenhuma barreira, uma espécie de é, acolhimento do outro sem nenhuma restrição. Então, a, a hospitalidade é, filosófica derridiana é uma hospitalidade que não é, reconhece fronteiras e que pensa é, um pouco a partir da, da, da imagem e da metáfora é, de do, do um anfitrião, do, do dono de uma casa, né? é, 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 fazendo um paralelo sobre é, o convite ao outro para entrar no seu lugar, ele não pode ser um convite que é, é, constrange e que coloca muitas condições para essa admissão, senão não haveria de fato e de verdade hospitalidade pura. Então, a, a filosofia derridiana da hospitalidade é uma filosofia que serve como interpelação crítica do modelo jurídico de hospitalidade, mostrando que, na opinião dele, é, o, o sujeito que vem de fora, esse sujeito estrangeiro, ele não deve é, 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 ser reconhecido apenas se soubermos quem ele é, qual o seu nome, de onde ele vem, é, por que ele quer entrar... E essa deve ser uma hospitalidade que garante não só um direito de visita, né, uma visita temporária, distrita à decisão soberânea do sujeito proprietário de uma casa, ou, é, é, numa analogia é, e no limite, a decisão do Estado soberano, mas a hospitalidade só estará presente de forma pura se ela for incondicional. Então, é, para o Derrida, a hospitalidade incondicional, ela acaba, de certa forma, é, rompendo com uma visão jurídica da hospitalidade e coloca hoje aquilo que é ainda um problema né, para a comunidade internacional e para uma perspectiva de uma nova cosmopolítica é, é, a, a, digamos assim, é, influenciar uma nova é, resposta aos, às demandas que continuam a ser apresentadas por migrantes e refugiados nos dias de hoje. De modo que é, a reflexão derridiana parece ser fundamental, né? permanece como uma, uma interpelação, assim como ele faz uma analogia sobre a diferença entre é, justiça e lei, a hospitalidade filosófica derridiana é, 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 serve também para, é, de certa forma, romper com, com a visão jurídica de hospitalidade kantiana. É, qual, qual tem sido, é, de certa forma, é, o meu ponto de interesse dentro, é, dentro desse debate sobre, digamos assim, é, modalidades distintas de pensar a hospitalidade dentro da filosofia política. Me parece que é, o tema derridiano é um tema é, fundamental. É, cada vez mais nós vemos como esse discurso influencia não apenas é, é, filósofos políticos, mas também é, juristas, inclusive é, as próprias é, narrativas da sociedade civil e de movimentos de imigrantes e refugiados. Há muitos movimentos que incorporam a ideia é, é, da ideia de sem fronteiras para é, fundamentar as suas plataformas, né, os seus discursos. E é, esse, esse tema ele tem um, um potencial crítico, mas é, ele também deixa de tematizar uma outra questão que me parece fundamental quando se faz essa rotação de perspectiva de análise de um foco é, que, que sai do Estado e passa para uma análise dos próprios sujeitos. Então, é, de um lado, o pensamento e o legado derridiano tem, é, de certa forma, uma força que nos permite atualizar criticamente o pensamento de Kant, mas também nos permite, é, digamos assim, é, a partir daquilo que foi proposto por ele, investir um pouco mais na discussão sobre a subjetividade, né, sobre a ideia de como pensar hoje é, a, o acolhimento desse outro, né, desse outro estrangeiro. Então, quando se fala a partir de uma perspectiva de hospitalidade incondicional, num acolhimento é, sem nenhuma distinção desse outro que vem, um dos pontos que, que, que essa resposta deixa de tematizar e que me parece fundamental quando nós pensamos na prática, né, no elemento concreto do que é hoje o desafio é, que 
que é colocado pela chegada de migrantes e refugiados ao nosso país, é a própria questão é, é, do sujeito estrangeiro, né, do sujeito refugiado. Então, quando se fala em hospitalidade incondicional, não somente se está, de certa forma, apagando, de um lado, a, a própria fronteira, já que não importa é, quem vem e de onde chega e não há critérios para a entrada, mas, de certa forma, é, tenta-se borrar também essa própria é, é, diferença e esse limite que é impossível de ser apagado, que é a fronteira é, que, que divide, de certa forma, o eu do outro. Então, a questão é, do eu e do outro é, é uma questão que se coloca é, e que é incontornável. Então, quando nós pensamos no que é na prática, o pedido de refúgio submetido hoje por uma pessoa que pede proteção internacional ao Estado brasileiro, essa cena é uma cena que vai passar sempre por uma situação material, é, concreta, é, num momento de encontro. E nesse encontro, que geralmente é um encontro, pode ser recortado como um encontro de um sujeito é, refugiado com um agente que representa o Estado brasileiro, é, vai colocar é, um problema concreto que é realmente ter que responder quem é esse outro em frente de mim, o que esse outro quer é, e como eu respondo essa pergunta vai definir é, a, a constituição, é, de certa forma, desse próprio sujeito e é reconhecimento ou não é, desse rosto, desse, desse outro sujeito é, perante o próprio Estado brasileiro. Então, essa situação concreta me parece algo que pode ser analisado é, nos seus próprios termos, é, em que, de certa forma, o encontro se torna o próprio quadro da hospitalidade. E essa cena em que é preciso é, responder quem é esse é, estrangeiro diante de si, vai ter implicações concretas né, é, para a situação dessa pessoa dentro do nosso próprio país. Então, é, essa cena do encontro é uma cena que é, coloca questões fundamentais, mas não só para o sujeito estrangeiro, mas também para o próprio é, sujeito na, na posição de oficial de elegibilidade, de entrevistador ou entrevistadora. Em primeiro lugar, porque o encontro é sempre, de certa forma, uma, uma cena que gera mútua afetação. E, e ao precisar responder quem é esse outro diante de mim, a pergunta é, por quem é o outro sempre descentra o próprio eu, né, o próprio self. Então, ao responder quem é esse outro, há sempre, é, de certa forma, a entrada em questão sobre quem é o próprio sujeito. Então, é, uma das primeiras é, situações interessantes nesse momento de encontro, é, entre dois sujeitos, é que é, a questão do reconhecimento se coloca, é, é preciso dizer quem esse outro é, e ao ter que responder quem é o outro sujeito, é, há uma situação de interrogação da própria subjetividade né, do sujeito que pergunta. É, de modo que é, a questão do eu e do outro é, retorna e é, acaba colocando a relevância de se pensar né, o que é, o sujeito estrangeiro, o que o sujeito refugiado representa para essa pessoa na posição de oficial de elegibilidade. Então, é, essa cena me parece uma cena fundamental, né, com uma dimensão ética é, 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 muito profunda e que... É, vai no cerne é, do, da própria questão de constituição é, é, da subjetividade. Então, se nós pensamos, de certa forma, em primeiro lugar, o que a, a, o recorte é, e o deslocamento da questão da hospitalidade para uma mirada sobre o momento do encontro permite, é, em primeiro lugar, colocar o, quadro do encontro, o encontro mesmo como quadro da questão da hospitalidade, e é, o encontro entre sujeitos como uma discussão que é, retoma o problema do reconhecimento. Né? Em primeiro lugar, porque é preciso dizer quem é esse outro, e é, e é só 
é, em determinadas condições, de acordo com os parâmetros da convenção, da própria lei de refugiados, que esse outro será reconhecível é, é, como um sujeito refugiado, né? existe uma série de critérios normativos, é preciso que as palavras expressem é, as condições que preenchem né, as características de uma pessoa é, refugiada, de acordo com o parâmetro legal em, vi em vigor, é, e isso é, coloca que, é, que é, é preciso, de certa forma, de uma é, é, performance é, identitária para a garantia de acesso a direitos. Então, é, em primeiro lugar, esse tema surge como um, uma, uma questão problemática, uma, uma questão que seria preciso enfrentar. Né? É, de outro lado, um outro é, 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 tema que decorre dessa análise é que não só é, esse, esse outro diante é, de si coloca o tema do, 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 do problema do reconhecimento dessa pessoa como é, uma pessoa refugiada, se os critérios legais forem atendidos, ou seja, se essa pessoa for capaz de uma performance identitária que revele que ela viveu, experienciou, uma situação de grave violação de direitos humanos, de perseguição por conta da raça, religião, nacionalidade, opinião política, ou foi vítima de graves violações de direitos humanos, mas também é, é, se coloca em questão a própria ideia é, 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 de em que medida esse, esse sujeito estrangeiro é, é um sujeito que, de certa forma, é, é, aparece como um sujeito que que sofre como um sujeito que teme. Né? O critério do artigo 1º da Lei 9474, a Lei de Refúgio do Brasil, é será reconhecido como refugiado o indivíduo que né, tiver é, 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 temor de perseguição devido às seguintes razões. Então, é, em primeiro lugar, se coloca a questão do reconhecimento. Em segundo lugar, o reconhecimento está condicionado à ideia de um sujeito que se subjetiva pelo próprio medo. Então, há um, um afeto central que circula nesse momento, é, que é o próprio temor. Então, é, esse, esse problema me parece é, particularmente interessante, é, um pouco da maneira como é, tem discutido o próprio é, filósofo é, Vladimir Safatli, é, sobre quais são os afetos que circulam dentro é, desse regime, e como, de certa forma, o medo se coloca como uma afecção central para garantir né, o reconhecimento dos direitos daquele sujeito. É, é, e isso é, não acontece sem algumas consequências. E, é, é, de outro lado, a questão do encontro entre os sujeitos, é, à medida em que é preciso reconhecer esse outro como um, um estrangeiro que teme, que sofreu perseguição por algumas razões, e de se discutir essa performance identitária, para garantir a, uma decisão positiva de proteção internacional pelo Estado, é, há também uma, algo que acontece dentro do, é, enfim, do próprio sujeito que entrevista. Então, quando é preciso dizer quem é esse outro, há, uma, há, um, há de certa forma, um questionamento que se é, 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 devolve para o próprio self e que, de certa forma, demonstra que é, a própria pessoa, na posição de oficial de elegibilidade, é, tem que lidar com, é, com, com, com seus próprios afetos, com uma maneira que ela própria vai narrar não só esse outro, mas é, a, si, a si próprio. Então, de certa forma, algo que me parece particularmente interessante é que, no momento de encontro, é, o que aparece também é não só... A, a identidade desse outro, mas a própria estrangeiridade de si. Ou seja, quando nós pensamos é, é, em quem nós somos, é, é impossível falar é, é, de maneira transparente sobre quem se é. Há sempre uma dimensão que é a marca da sua própria é, subjetividade que vem ou que é da ordem da estrangeiridade. De certa forma, é, é, somos marcados por aquilo é, sobre o que nós não podemos falar, algo que é, ultrapassa a dimensão da própria razão é, e que, portanto, mostra que todo sujeito tem, de certa forma, a marca é, de um estrangeiro. Quando falamos o nosso próprio nome completo, 
temos já ali inscrito não só é, um significante que não foi por nós escolhido, mas que veio de fora e que, é, enfim, remete sempre a algo que veio, que veio é, enfim, do, do, da ordem do, do estrangeiro. Então, isso significa que a ideia de estrangeiridade é e pode ser pensada como a, a marca da própria é, identidade. Então, isso nos permite é, um pouco repensar dentro do nosso próprio campo de, de, de estudo, de interesses, é, uma das questões mais interessantes é, é, da psicanálise para a própria filosofia. Então, a ideia é, de un, un, unheimlich, a ideia de unheimlichkeit, a ideia de, de, de estrangeiridade, é, que marca um pouco é, esse momento do encontro e que vem à tona. E é por isso que é tão... É estranho pensar a questão do estrangeiro. E se nós vivemos hoje é, um momento em que o radical da palavra hospitalidade se revela em toda a sua ambiguidade, quer dizer, é, hospitalidade tanto no sentido de hóspedes quanto de hostes, né? há tanto em jogo quando se pensa na questão do acolhimento do outro, é, não só... A, a, o regime de proteção internacional, mas toda é, uma reação também muito violenta que aparece em discursos é, de é, reativos, é, securitários ou é, é, com notas de xenofobia, por conta desse mal-estar da hospitalidade que nós vivemos hoje, né? por conta da dificuldade é, de, de ter um discurso que nos permita é, pensar é, o grande desafio que é hoje a própria política é, da hospitalidade. Então, se há hoje é, esse mal-estar, isso está ligado não só a, uma, a um confronto entre modelos distintos de hospitalidade, né? uma, um, um choque entre a ideia de uma hospitalidade condicional, condicionada, com parâmetros limitados, versus uma hospitalidade incondicional. É, não é só isso que está em jogo hoje. O que está em jogo hoje é também a maneira como nós nos constituímos como sujeito, a maneira como nós lidamos com aquilo que é estrangeiro dentro de nós, e no limite, o que uma ética do encontro permite é, encaminhar é que a resposta a, a esse estrangeiro diante de si será, de certa forma, condicionada pela resposta que nós damos ao estrangeiro dentro de si, dentro de nós mesmos, ao estrangeiro, de certa forma, que logo somos. Então, é, enfim, a maneira como eu tenho um pouco pensado o problema da hospitalidade hoje está articulada a essa nova maneira de discutir é, subjetividade é, e constituição dos sujeitos, pensando um pouco é, em como é, incorporar a questão da estrangeiridade como marca da própria identidade, o que pode é, cons, é, terminar em uma resposta diferente, né? não só... É, para dizer quem nós somos, mas também para permitir é, ver nesse outro, não só alguém que representa uma alteridade absoluta, mas também alguém que com a sua diferença guarda algo de comum. Eu acredito que a potência do comum, a capacidade de fazermos um novo é, corpo num novo lugar, é uma lição que os refugiados é, é, afirmam com a coragem da sua luta é, e que tem um potencial político muito interessante para é, repensar como é possível é, coabitar, coexistir e fazer, independente de, é, de ter ou não nacionalidade ou reconhecimento do Estado, a, a possibilidade de é, construir é, é, uma luta comum por um novo, uma nova comunidade política, onde, de certa forma, a capacidade de é, ser povo já não está mais dependendo é, da própria é, é, nacionalidade ou é, cidadania. Então, de certa forma, essa possibilidade de afirmar é, 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 atos de cidadania nos mostra que, que é possível, e talvez essa seja uma, uma lição que nós aprendemos com os próprios refugiados, né? é possível é, é, ultrapassar esses, esses limites que condicionam esses corpos. Né? Os refugiados são muitas vezes lidos hoje 
como corpos é, fora de lugar, é, subjetividades que, por serem quem são, é, não podem integrar a comunidade política do seu país de origem e, e é essa experiência desse limite e a sua ultrapassagem é, que demonstra como é possível construir um novo corpo num novo lugar. Então, isso de um lado aponta para o direito, né, os limites da nossa própria democracia, o, é, é, de certa forma, é, na linha derridiana, coloca como, muitas vezes, a fronteira são... É, a fronteira é hoje, talvez, um, um dos elementos que aponta a, a, aquilo que há de antidemocrático nas nossas democracias, mas também, num sentido é, é, muito interessante, nos mostra, é, a partir desses encontros, como é possível é, 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 aos corpos é, fora de lugar é, fazerem, é, de certa forma, a, a, a afirmação de é, é, não só é, poderem estar aqui, mas poderem, né, de certa forma, ser daqui também. É, eu acho que é isso. Então, é, eu acredito que, se nós pensarmos a partir é, de uma ética do encontro, talvez consigamos, de maneira mais produtiva, é, recolocar em cena um debate fundamental é, que nos permite pensar no direito internacional dos refugiados, para além de um campo é, de reconhecimento de direitos a partir de uma performance identitária e é, que retome um pouco a questão fundamental no encontro entre os sujeitos, que é a resposta ao estrangeiro. Diante de si, é, vem como consequência de como respondemos ao estrangeiro né, dentro de nós mesmos. Acho que é isso. Muito obrigado. É, boa tarde Eu queria parabenizar Eu achei excelente a ideia do, Da ética do encontro E eu queria explorar isso um pouco mais Há um autor chamado Omibaba Acho que você deve ter conhecimento Em que ele produz um livro chamado Local de Cultura E esse local de cultura é onde Se inventa, se produz novos sujeitos, onde, por exemplo, o colonizador entra em contato com o colonizado e aí surgem novas figuras que antes já não existiam, que não que não existem mais. Então, são são novas figuras. Queria saber que como a gente pode contemplar, é, na ética do encontro, como acho que a sua narrativa chega um, aproxima-se um pouco disso, quando o sujeito se pergunta sobre a estrangeiridade dele mesmo, como a gente pode contemplar isso no direito internacional, essa produção das novas subjetividades? É, e, por, só acrescentando um pouquinho a essa própria pergunta, a produção da subjetividade, é, para alguns autores como Quirrano, são apontados como uma violência, em que você reduz a história do outro, você reduz a cultura do outro, para que você consiga encaixar ele numa categoria tal, que acabe sendo a, o seu próprio, a sua própria subjetividade, para que você possa se colocar nesse lugar. Então, a produção do termo refugiado, e aí quando você diz ele é um refugiado, você acaba englobando ele numa categoria que acaba um pouco negando a cultura, negando a história, e colocando um rótulo sobre ele, para além do que ele possuía antes. Como é que a gente como pode conseguir adaptar um pouco isso? Será que esse termo refugiado ele pode ser tão apropriado nesse sentido? Obrigado. Alguém mais? Boa tarde. Bem, Gabriel, alegria de estar tá, escutar. Gabriel, alegria de escutar. É, fico muito contemplada com a sua fala. Talvez porque a minha seja a área da psicanálise, então dialogue muito com o que você vem dizendo. Eu queria colocar uma questão. É, eu trabalho há dois meses com jovens em situação de refúgio e imigração. E nesse trabalho a gente faz conversações psicanalíticas, oficina de ateliê de escrita e montagem de um livro artesanal, que é o produto final desse trabalho. 
E uma das falas que um dos jovens trouxe é que há o um impossível da integração. E exatamente por isso é que é possível inventar algo novo. E eu acho essa fala desse jovem muito... Acho que ela traz a dimensão ética num ponto muito preciso, que há um impossível da integração. Então, eu queria te escutar um pouco em relação a essa fala do jovem e a dimensão que você traz da ética do encontro. Obrigada. Boa tarde. Eu gostaria que você falasse um pouco mais é, quando esse sujeito que ele tinha uma determinada identidade e ocorre um determinado fato que gera uma um grave perseguição política ou temor, que a pessoa começa, esse indivíduo começa a passar e ele vai para um outro lugar onde ele tem que descobrir uma nova identidade, até mesmo através da narrativa da, da, da vida dele. Ele, nesse encontro com a gente, ele, a, ele começa a criar um processo que pode durar muito tempo, porque muitos é, passam um período enorme como solicitante e depois, uma vez que se torna, é, ganha um status de refugiados, aí se cria uma nova identidade e também como ela é construída nessa hospitalidade, porque é, é tudo algo novo, é, é uma, é, tem uma relação de... Oi. É, que essa relação é uma relação de poder, então, eu gostaria que você falasse um pouco mais dessa criação de uma nova identidade desse sujeito, do encontro e dessa relação de poder com, com a gente. Tem mais alguma pessoa aqui? Alô, foi. É, Gabriel, obrigada pelas suas palavras. Eu não sou do direito, eu sou mestre em hospitalidade. É show. Eu também. <risos> Vamos lá. Puxa, muitas questões, né? Obrigado pelas perguntas. Não sei se vou responder à altura, vou tentar encaminhar a partir do que é, eu tentei construir aqui na minha intervenção. Em primeiro lugar, é, cadê o meu camarada ali? Desde é, é, do que você aponta, home baba, né? É, em relação ao local da cultura, é, definitivamente. Acho que é preciso encarar a questão é, do encontro também na sua dimensão de violência, é, não só é, no campo da intersubjetividade, se é que isso é possível, mas também na maneira concreta como isso acontece. Né? Eu acho que se nós pensamos o encontro dos povos, é, particularmente dentro do nosso próprio país, a ideia de Brasil, o Brasil como Estado-nação, nasceu de certa forma desse evento é, é, violento que foi o encontro dos povos que hoje marcam, de certa forma, a identidade do próprio brasileiro ou brasileira. Então, veja, é, não é por acaso que a própria discussão também é, kantiana sobre hospitalidade 
estava ligado também, não só uma perspectiva do news cosmopolítico, mas também é, da expansão ultramarina dos estados europeus, é, que viam também é, no encontro com outros povos uma oportunidade é, para o seu comércio. Então, isso não está distante quando nós pensamos no que é a questão colonial e na sua permanência, né, nesse passado que não passa, que integra, de certa forma, o nosso próprio presente, a própria marca né, da emergência do Brasil como Estado-nação vem também daí, isso significa que é, é, é preciso justamente recolocar esse mal-estar da hospitalidade dentro é, é, da maneira é, que nós compreendemos é, os pró as, as próprias contradições do que vem a ser o, o, o povo brasileiro. Né? Eu acredito que quando nós temos que lidar hoje com os desafios do tema da migração, e do refúgio, isso, isso emerge de maneira muito clara, né, em toda a sua radicalidade e violência. É, claramente, é, a, a forma como nós narramos o nosso próprio Estado-nação, é, é, que é dizer que o Brasil é um país de imigrantes, um país é, de um povo que é resultado do amálgama do encontro dos brancos, dos negros, dos indígenas, é, tem uma dimensão que fica oculta, não dita e, de certa forma, recalcada, que hoje retorna. Então, é, todo o mal-estar da hospitalidade hoje e toda a ambiguidade da nossa política de hospitalidade vem também é, é, desse momento original. Então, é, para mim, a maneira mais interessante de pensar isso, a partir da questão que você trouxe do, do Baba, sobre o local da cultura, é justamente como nós tratamos hoje os próprios povos indígenas. Quando nós pensamos o que acontece agora, na região norte, na Amazônia brasileira, com a chegada dos indígenas Uaral, da Venezuela, do Delta do Vale do Orinoco, e que é, 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 começaram a ser deportados pela polícia, antes de serem acolhidos. Né? E nós vimos um, um, uma enorme é, discriminação e, e, e xenofobia contra essas populações. Nada me parece mais violento do que a resposta que eu escutei de agentes é, 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 que representam o próprio Estado e que chamam esses indígenas venezuelanos de estrangeiros. Eu acho que não há nada mais violento do que chamar um indígena de estrangeiro. Mas isso é tão revelador é, é, de como nós encaminhamos a nossa imagem né, como é, Estado-nação e a nossa própria política da hospitalidade. Então, eu acredito que é, há uma, uma discussão interessante sobre a, 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 a questão indígena, é porque, de certa forma, poderíamos fazer um paralelo é, para pensar os indígenas como se estivessem, de certa forma, nessa posição de refúgio. Né? Eles são, de certa forma, esse estrangeiro interno. Né? Eles são, de certa forma, esse outro lado da nossa população que nós negamos é, é, e que, por outro lado, são os habitantes originários desse pedaço de chão. Então, é, o mal-estar da hospitalidade, de certa forma, é algo que está no cerne né, da nossa própria comunidade política. Enquanto nós não tivermos, é, de certa forma, uma, a, a, uma, uma, uma é, capacidade de... Enfim, enquanto nós não formos capazes de pensar um outro, um outro modo de encontro e de é, vida em comum com, a, com, com esses sujeitos, é, nós seguiremos nesse impasse. É, acho que era isso que eu teria a dizer para você é, Sobre a questão da, da psicanálise é, Enfim, eu achei genial a, a frase que você escutou né? como, como, como é interessante realmente a, a, a prática analítica E como emerge isso assim, pela palavra Aquilo que às vezes é tão difícil de explicar em termos técnicos né? A partir do direito, especialmente Quer dizer, a ideia... É, da impossibilidade da integração, como, é, por outro lado, aquilo que nos permite inventar algo novo, talvez resuma o que pode ser é, é, um, um, uma ética de um bom encontro. Eu acho que, infelizmente, é, é preciso realmente passar por essa experiência do, é, do desamparo absoluto para é, conseguir fazer disso 
algo é, que, que afirme né, esse novo corpo nesse novo lugar e a chance de, de construção do novo espaço comum, de uma nova comunidade política, onde essa pessoa é, possa contar como sujeito. Então, eu acredito que, certamente, né, é, 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 os refugiados é, passam por é, uma dupla exclusão, né, de certa forma, são sujeitos... É, politicamente excluídos da sua comunidade de origem é, e que terminam muitas vezes num processo excludente na comunidade de acolhida e passam pela experiência violenta do que é ser refugiado no nosso país por todo é, é, o desafio que representa é, o processo de reconhecimento da sua condição pelo Estado, mas também por conta da dimensão material é, dos impasses da hospitalidade é, barra hostilidade, que significa construir a sua vida num outro país, é, como estrangeiro. Então, é, é, certamente a integração é impossível é, e talvez a integração absoluta seja também indesejável, no sentido de que é preciso que haja, sim, esse espaço é, que é a marca do si mesmo e que permite é, é, afirmar-se quem se é, né, eu acredito um pouco na linha leminskiana, né, num paralelo ao que falou esse jovem refugiado, de que aquilo, aquilo de ser exatamente é, é, o que a gente é ainda vai nos levar além. Então, eu acredito que, de fato, é, a experiência política dos refugiados mostra que esses sujeitos não são a encarnação da alteridade radical e nem da vítima absoluta. Não são pessoas... É, é, vítimas das paixões tristes, né? muitas vezes como é, nós descrevemos esses sujeitos né? dentro da academia. Os, os refugiados também é, é, podem ser os sujeitos que têm a coragem é, 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 de se afirmar como sujeito a despeito de toda a precariedade é, da sua condição no país de origem ou da condição em que são recebidos no país de acolhimento. E é essa ultrapassagem de todos os limites é, para afirmar a sua própria subjetividade que nos permite pensar, talvez em paralelo com o que os indígenas nos permitem pensar, que é, é contra a ideia de que o fim é, do mundo daqueles sujeitos é possível construir um outro. Né? É... Em relação à questão da criação de outro sujeito pelo encontro, não sei se, se é por aí, talvez vá mais ou menos na mesma direção, não sei se eu, se eu te respondi, a gente pode conversar mais tarde, mas é, é isso, é, é, é por aí. A ideia é de que a gente pode afirmar outros afetos é, e, portanto, pensar o processo de subjetivação de uma outra maneira, é, em que esses sujeitos é, é, trazem para nós é, não apenas a ideia de que há um estrangeiro dentro de si, mas que todos nós somos marcados, de certa forma, também por um refúgio. Quer dizer, a grande lição dos refugiados é que é possível é, é, ultrapassar o seu próprio lugar. Né? Eu acho que é importante a gente, é, talvez, enfrentar esse tema da possibilidade de você se insurgir contra o seu próprio lugar. Eu, pelo menos, faço isso um pouco com o meu próprio lugar de fala, né? contra ele também. É, sobre hospitalidade e dádiva, esse é um mote derridiano, é, mausiano, é, belíssimo. Então, acredito que está relacionado ao, ao momento da discussão sobre... É, 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 dom, um tema clássico na antropologia, um tema belíssimo... E, enfim, eu acho que você matou a charada, é isso. Realmente, se nós fôssemos olhar a partir da perspectiva derridiana de hospitalidade, nada mais triste do que pensar que hospitalidade é, é, marca hoje muito mais o signo de um setor do mercado <risos> do que é, uma política de reconhecimento ou de acolhimento. Talvez não por acaso, muito próprio do nosso momento é, político é, contemporâneo, e realmente é, é, há algo de inóspito 
na burocracia, há algo de perigoso e hostil é, na fronteira. Há muitas vezes, na história que nós escutamos, dos migrantes e dos refugiados, aquele momento de perigo em que a ambiguidade é, do radical da palavra hospitalidade se materializa, né? em que a pessoa efetivamente corre o risco de ser dessubjetivada, né? de ter o seu corpo é, 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 eliminado por uma ação é, de exceção que já é, é, não encontra nenhum parâmetro, porque as próprias regras, de certa forma, se, se encontram suspensas e não se aplicam para aquele sujeito, é, que às vezes pode, no limite, é, 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 morrer sem que aquilo signifique efetivamente um crime é, é, como tal. Então, acho que há um, um encaminhamento desse problema a partir do, do mote agambeniano, né? é, biopolítica, tanatopolítica, que tem sido rediscutido hoje, por, por exemplo, pelo Aquile Mambembe, né? a ideia de necropolítica, os corpos que nós vemos no mar, as vidas que podem morrer sem que nós possamos é, fazer um luto sobre isso e permanecemos discutindo a crise humanitária, é, o problema dos refugiados, sem começar pela própria violência estrutural dos estados que deixaram... É, 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 de tematizar a própria violência da resposta que dão a essas pessoas. Né? Essas pessoas que se encontram naquele momento é, kafkiano, né? do diante da lei, pedindo acesso à justiça, que a porta da justiça se abra e ficam eternamente à espera até o momento da sua morte sem nenhuma resposta. Então, eu acredito que... É, a discussão sobre a hospitalidade e dádiva tem um encaminhamento na filosofia política que me parece importante recuperar, é, para que nós possamos ver é, essas pessoas como sujeitos políticos e contra toda a resposta é, é, de, de hostilidade, afirmar um pouco uma luta comum, é, que é a luta dos refugiados, mas é também a luta dos migrantes e é, de certa forma, a nossa luta. Nós, quando olhamos para os refugiados, talvez o mais assustador é que nós percebemos que, é, dependendo do momento e do lugar, nós podemos também nos encontrar naquela posição. E nós podemos também, infelizmente, dependendo da maneira em que isso aconteça, é, estarmos na, na situação daquele que é colocado como um corpo fora de lugar e um corpo que pode ser... É, é, eliminado sem que isso represente é, um impacto na ordem jurídica do nosso próprio Estado. Quando a gente pensa o que acontece hoje, não só com os povos indígenas, mas nas favelas brasileiras, eu acho que é muito claro é, em que medida é preciso pensar, não somente aquilo que temos de diferente, mas aquilo que nós temos em comum com a luta dessas pessoas. Muito obrigado. Sim. Uh, obrigado, Gabriel. Uh, então, a gente passa para a sessão seguinte, com a Aitin. Yeah. Uh, going to be less on Arendt and more the struggle of migrants now in the rightlessness in the age of rights. So, you want to, do you have the PowerPoint there? Or? Good afternoon, everyone. 
So the microphone is working? I'm hoping. No? Good afternoon. Which button? There is one button, but you can't hear me? Should I just? Okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? You can? Okay. Good afternoon again. And I would like to start by reiterating my thanks to Charles and also, again, uh, the UNHCR Brazil for uh, financially supporting uh, this summer course and inviting me here, hosting me here. I'm very pleased to be here, and I'm delighted and honored to be in this company. Um, my presentation today will be f following from the presentation uh, my first presentation on Tuesday, uh, I tried to give you a broad overview of my research on human rights and migration on Tuesday. I especially tried to highlight the key ideas and arguments that I take from the work of 20th century political theorist Hannah Arendt, um, especially on the topic of statelessness, human rights, and the question of legal personhood. Today I will be giving you more concrete examples of how I conduct a critical analysis of human rights in order to understand some of the challenging problems that migrants face as they try to claim and exercise their most fundamental rights. And I would like to start this presentation by a brief reflection on the drastic increase uh, in the number of migrant deaths uh, I will particularly talk about uh, the Mediterranean, but this is a problem in other parts of the world, and I live in the U.S. now. It is a problem especially on the U.S.-Mexico border as well. So let's talk a little bit about what is going on in the Mediterranean. The Mediterranean Sea has become a graveyard, according to many observers. We have now normalized the news stories about migrant boat tragedies. This is how they are referred to oftentimes, uh, oftentimes uh, in the uh, news media with photos of capsized boats and body bags lined up on a beach. You can see some examples of these photos and the headlines uh, to basically illustrate how they are usually covered in the news media. These tragedies, so-called tragedies, uh, because I will also try to show how s border policies of states are actively involved in creating these so-called accidents. So these tragedies are often treated as accidents or unfortunate incidents. And I think that framing makes it impossible to hold any actor responsible. But anyone slightly familiar with the immigration control policies of European states since the late 1990s could point out that it is precisely these policies that have criminalized the movement of people across borders, significantly limited the right of asylum, and pushed migrants to make more and more dangerous journeys. When you look at the predominant narratives uh, about forced displacement today, when you look at the discourses of crisis and security, we realize that these discourses, these narratives, make it impossible for us to recognize these migrant deaths as homicides, as criminal acts. The dead migrants become today's homines sacri, to use the Latin term used by Giorgio Agamben, sacred man, to uh, have the English translation. They are rendered bare lives who can be killed with impunity and whose deaths cannot even be commemorated. This problem strikes us powerfully in the aftermath of these so-called accidents. There are no established procedures in place to identify the dead, inform their families, and bury them with proper rituals. The bodies of migrants often cannot be recovered, and in cases of recovery, they remain most of the time undocumented or anonymous, 
and their families most of the time cannot be notified. I would like to talk briefly about this project, the Missing Migrants Project, launched by the International Organization of Migration. Uh, International Organization of Migration launched this project in response to the death of at least 368 migrants near the Italian island of Lampedusa in October 2013. And when you look at the numbers for 2016, you see a very troubling picture. Uh, the project records 7,927 migrants dead or missing worldwide in 2016, and it reports that 5,143 of these deaths were in the Mediterranean. As you can see on the slide, there seems to be a decrease in the number of deaths this year, 2017 so far. At the time I checked, uh, right before this, uh, right before I uh, came to uh, Rio, International Organization for Migration of Migration reported 3,086 deaths in the Mediterranean. So we may think of this as a decrease, but actually it's not. Because we have to note the drastic decrease in the number of arrivals at least partly due to the infamous deal between the European Union and Turkey. This agreement went into effect in March 2016, and it dictates that migrants arriving in Greece should be automatically returned to Turkey. If you look at the proportion of deaths versus arrivals, we see again, actually, an increase. And we should also note that these are very conservative estimates. Even with these conservative estimates, we are speaking of nothing less than carnage. The Mediterranean as the graveyard of migrants calls, out, calls for an urgent reckoning with the borders of human rights. More specifically, it demands careful attention to the limitations of these rights when it comes to challenging the lethal border policies justified in the name of territorial sovereignty. Especially pressing in this regard is a critical inquiry into the quite peculiar formulation of the human person, which I talked about on my in my presentation on Tuesday. This phrase, the human person, it's repetitively invoked in our human rights documents. Um, you see it in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, you see it in ICCPR. And I mentioned in my first presentation, basically, that the human rights framework um, signifies an important shift, according to many scholars, um, shifting the basis of entitlement to rights from citizenship to personhood in many respects. So you are claiming rights as a person, and as a human being, you are supposed to be recognized as a person before the law, regardless of your citizenship status. That's the idea that we are seeing with the rise of a universal human rights framework. And this is an important development because if you think about what happened for most of human history, these two terms, human and person, were not interchangeable. I think I forgot to, no, actually no. For most of human history, these two terms were not interchangeable, right? Uh, there were many human beings who were not considered to be persons before the law. Of course, the paradigmatic case is slavery, but we can also remember women who were not considered uh, as persons before the law for a long time. The human rights framework then brings together these two terms that remain separate for most of human history, and it announces that every human being should be recognized as a person before the law. So I would like to ask two key questions in this presentation today, and those are the questions that you see on the slide. The first one is the following. To what extent does the existing human rights framework allow migrants to appear as persons equal before the law, in life and in death. The second question, to what extent can the human rights framework 
be mobilized for the purpose of criticizing border policies that render migrants non-persons in life and in death. So those are my two key questions. And I will address these two questions by drawing on Hannah Arendt's work on statelessness, analysis of statelessness, which I discussed on uh, Tuesday. But also today, I would like to give you some concrete examples, as I said. And I will be looking at this court case, um, 2012 European Court of Human Rights case, uh, Hirsi Jama and others v. Italy. It's a case about maritime interception, interception of migrants on the high seas, and whether human rights law is applicable on the high seas. Right? And why does this matter? European states have increasingly resorted to interception on the high seas for the purpose of stopping migrants before they could reach their territories. The goal here is to make sure that the migrants cannot even enter their territorial jurisdiction so that they can basically evade their obligations under their domestic laws and more importantly under international human rights law. And the case that I'm going to talk about concerns the availability of fundamental rights to migrants intercepted on the high seas. The court ruled in favor of the migrant applicants and it argued that Italy violated their rights by blocking their arrival, denying them the possibility of claiming asylum, and returning them to Libya. When you look at the discussion of uh, this court case by human rights organizations, you see that the ruling has been welcomed um, as a forceful blow against the efforts of migrant receiving states to turn the high seas into a lawless storm. According to many human rights organizations, the court with this ruling basically said that the high seas is not a lawless storm. Human rights law applies on the high seas as well. I would like to complicate the picture here today a little bit, and I would like to raise some questions about that conclusion. I want to suggest that the Hersey ruling, uh, this 2012 reading, ruling, actually illustrates many of the paradoxes of human rights that I presented to you on Tuesday. So those paradoxes that were examined by Hannah Arendt much before the institutionalization of the human rights framework, I want to say, are still manifest in this court case, uh, in this ruling. And particularly, I will be talking about the tensions between two principles that we see in the human rights framework the principle of universal personhood and the principle of territorial sovereignty. I think the perplexities of human rights, the paradoxes of human rights that Hannah Arendt discussed um, when she was examining statelessness, of, uh, statelessness in the first half of 20th century become perhaps even more palpable today with new migration control policies. What we are seeing more increasingly, uh, especially with policies such as maritime interception, is a changing conception of the border. The border does no longer seem to be this fixed, static um, frontier. You still have walls, right, physical walls. They symbolize state sovereignty in many respects, but uh, borders are, go are no longer only physical walls. They are no longer these static frontiers. And I will use a term, a phrase that uh, French philosopher Etienne Bolibar uses. We now see vacillating borders, right? They are, borders are continuously shifting and they are proliferating in the global management of migration. And I want to suggest that there is a tight connection between these changing border control practices on the one hand and migrant deaths. So the crucial question becomes for us is whether or not the existing human rights framework could be mobilized to contest these policies. To briefly 
uh, give you uh, give away the conclusion uh, of my presentation. As you will see, it's a grim conclusion. When I, uh, in my analysis of this case from 2012, basically um, shows that uh, the existing international system still ties rights uh, to the principle of territoriality. And uh, as a result, we, what we are seeing is that with these border control practices, more and more migrants are becoming precarious persons. I will talk more about that term that I introduced on Tuesday. As I will highlight at the end, these perplexities of human rights are not dead ends. So I don't want the conclusion to be so grim that you will leave uh, in a very, very pessimistic mood. I want to suggest the possibility that these paradoxes of human rights can be navigated in more promising ways so that uh, we offer more robust guarantees of fundamental rights to migrants. And to give you a concrete example of these more promising possibilities, I will turn to the separate opinion that was written by the Portuguese judge, Paulo Sergio Albuquerque, in the Hersey case. I'll present that opinion as an effort to rethink human rights in terms of what Hannah Arendt called the right to have rights. We did not have time to talk about that phrase on Tuesday, but it's a really crucial term, uh, especially among scholars working on Arendt. Before I discuss the Hersey case, it may be useful to recall uh, some of the key arguments from my presentation on Tuesday. Many of you uh, were there, but I know that some of you were not there, so I will just recap some of the key arguments from Tuesday about statelessness, human rights, and personhood. So Arendt, if you remember, was writing about statelessness uh, that occurred massive scales of statelessness in the first half of 20th century. And she argues that this problem of massive statelessness uh, brings forth a troubling paradox, reveals a troubling paradox in the human rights. The inalienable rights that human beings were assumed to have by birth turned out to be unenforceable once people lost their citizenship status and became stateless. So once you became stateless, you lost not only your citizenship rights, but you also lost your human rights, she says. So that problem uh, is captured by her phrase rightlessness. The stateless people found themselves in a condition of rightlessness she argues. And if you remember our discussion on Tuesday, uh, there are multiple interrelated dimensions of rightlessness. One dimension is basically the loss of legal personhood. Right? Another one is basically the loss of a political community that is willing to guarantee your rights. And the third one, and they are all interrelated, the third one is expulsion from humanity, in the sense that you are literally excluded from the common world shared by human beings. And I mentioned refugee camps, how they physically isolate refugees from the rest of the world. So in my first presentation, I focused especially on the legal dimension. Uh, and I talked about basically Arendt's arguments about personhood, legal personhood. What I would like to do today is to continue that conversation um, but I want to um, basically give you more concrete examples by turning to this 2012 case, Hirsi Gemma and others v. Italy. This legal dimension is really interesting, precisely because we had so many developments in the field of human rights since the end of World War II, since the time Arendt completed her analysis. We would expect this dimension of the problem to disappear, right? But interestingly, as I will highlight in the analysis of this case, um, there have been important developments, the most important being the human rights framework recognizes every human being as a person before the law, regardless of citizenship or immigration status. But on the other hand, something that I highlighted on Tuesday is that 
most fundamental rights have very tenuous or fragile guarantees in the case of migrants facing detention, deportation, and today we will talk about maritime interception. And I said this problem, right, this continuous, continuing problem, basically urges us to rethink what be our common assumptions about personhood. And I mentioned on Tuesday how we often uh, use the terms human and person interchangeably. Um, but in a legal sense, personhood has a very specific meaning. It is the status assigned by law to rights-bearing subjects. Right? And I uh, argued as a result of that that we should understand personhood as a legal construct or as a legal artifact. And that is very different from understanding personhood as something inherent in your humanness, right? As if you're uh, some kind of essential human characteristic, whether that's reason, dignity, or autonomy, or sanctity, makes you automatically person. As I will show, that's not really the case. So if you recall, I uh, shared with you some of the arguments that Arendt makes about personhood in her various works, uh, especially by turning to how that term was used in the Roman law. She reminds us of the Latin etymology of the term person. It comes from persona. And persona originally referred to the masks that actors wore in a play in the ancient context. And it was the Romans who, for the first time, used it metaphorically and carried its meaning to the legal domain so that it came to be understood as this mask that is assigned by the law and that makes you a, a, a person bearing rights, entitled to rights, right? So Romans, and that's what Arendt finds really important about them, make a distinction between human beings in their natural condition versus legal persons who are entitled to rights. And if you recall, uh, she, uh, Arendt was making a connection etymologically again between the term persona and personare, which basically means, literally, etymologically means to sound through. So she uh, emphasizes that uh, the mask that these actors wore had a, had an opening in the place of the mouth so the voice of the actor could sound through. And I shared that etymology and I highlighted that this uh, Arendt's distinctive understanding of personhood is important for at least two reasons. First, it basically shows us that personhood is something, is a status that is made and unmade by law. It's not something natural. It's not something given or inherent. It's an artificial construct, which basically means that there is a gap between these two terms that we usually use interchangeably, human and person, right? They are not identical. That's what we realize when we attend to its Latin etymology and its Roman use. Second, once we realize that there is a gap between human and person, we also realize a very troubling possibility. And that is the possibility that not every human being is automatically recognized as a person entitled to rights. Right? And even when you have that kind of formal recognition, we may say that every human being has that kind of formal recognition now, at least within the framework of international human rights law, what this what Arendt's analysis highlights is the possibility that that recognition can be taken away. And even if it's not fully taken away, it can be unmade or diminished so much so that some human beings are rendered semi-persons and even, even non-persons. That's one of the possibilities that I will be talking about today. So to address these points, so we have a summary of the key arguments that I shared uh, with you on Tuesday. Uh, so to address uh, these points about human rights and personhood, 
I would like to now turn to this case that I mentioned, this 2012 case from the European Court of Human Rights, Hirsi Gemma and others v. Italy. The case concerned the interception of three boats that held Somali and Eritrean migrants going from Libya to Italy. The Italian Coast Guard intercepted the ships, confiscated the identity documents of migrants, forcefully returned them to Tripoli, and this was all done in accordance with the bilateral agreement that Italy signed with Libya under Colonel Gaddafi. So before I uh, discuss the details of the specific case, I would like to highlight that the maritime interception that we are seeing in this particular case is part of a broader global trend. Right? What we are seeing increasingly in migration control is what many scholars have referred to as extraterritorialization. Right? We are seeing extraterritorialization of border control. And what do I mean by this term? Right? Extraterritorialization includes a wide range of practices. So maritime interception is one example. But if you recall, there is that agreement between Italy and Libya I mentioned. It also includes a wide range of bilateral and multilateral agreements to outsource border control to countries of origin and transit. It includes maritime operations to intercept migrants on the high seas so that you are trying to basically evade obligations under international law. It also uh, involves removal of certain territories from jurisdiction of a country. The paradigmatic example of this is Guantanamo, of course, and when I say Guantanamo, you will probably immediately think of enemy aliens detained in Guantanamo uh, uh, during the war uh, on terror. But what I have in mind is actually a prior policy that the U.S. had in 1980s and 1990s. Um, they would basically, the U.S. government would, uh, had this policy of intercepting Cuban and Haitian uh, migrants um, and before they could reach the U.S. and they would hold them in Guantanamo Bay to be able to basically deny them rights including due process that they would have if they were to arrive uh, uh, to the U.S. More recently, you may be familiar with uh, the case of Australia, how Australia cut off uh, basically now its entire mainland from its migration zone so that it can automatically transfer all unauthorized maritime arrivals to detention centers in Nauru or Manus Island. So this, these are basically very uh, striking examples of extraterritorialization, where you see efforts of states to make sure that the migrants do not even enter their territorial jurisdiction. Because once they enter the territorial jurisdiction, the states would be bound by domestic laws as well as international laws. They are trying to basically evade those laws. And by doing that, I want to say, they are also try they are trying to basically deny the personhood of these migrants before the law. They are effectively unmaking the personhood of these migrants that are intercepted. So to go back to the Hersey case, the applicants claim that the Italian uh, maritime interception gave rise to several human rights violations. They argued that Italy violated Article 3 of the European Convention of Human Rights. Uh, this prohibits torture or inhuman or degrading treatment. Right? They also added that the interception was in violation of the principle of non refoulement guaranteed by Article 33 of the Refugee Convention, and that prohibits the return of a person to a place that, where they are likely to uh, face well-founded fear of persecution. The applicants also claim that by returning them to Libya without even attempting to individually assess their cases, Italy has violated the norm against collective expulsion, right? Basically engaged in collective expulsion.
In its unanimous decision, to, the court agreed with the applicants and found Italy guilty of violation in each case. And as you can imagine, the Hersey case was celebrated as a victory by many human rights organizations. And I don't want to underestimate its value or importance for uh, offering fundamental protections to migrants. But at the same time, I think that assessment is missing something. As I've already indicated, I would like to raise some reservations about that conclusion, which basically sees Horsi as this kind of historic ruling that, uh, uh, that, makes, that extends rights beyond territorial jurisdiction. Right. So how do we look at this case, this Hersey case, from uh, Arendt's perspective, from, by using some of the arguments that we encountered in Arendt's analysis of statelessness. First, in a very troubling move, the court refused legal standing to two migrants who died during the course of proceedings in unknown circumstances. And I will say their names because uh, anonymity is one of the problems that we are seeing with these migrant deaths. So these are Muhammad Abukar Muhammad and Hassan Sherif Abirahman. And at first sight, this decision seems to be in line with court's uh, previous decisions. Um, and the court basically said that uh, when an applicant died in the past uh, during the course of the proceedings and when there was no co close relative to pursue the case, um, similar decisions were made. However, from a legal perspective, the court's ruling, I think, is questionable. First one does not necessarily lose legal personhood when one dies, right? The dead can enter into various kinds of uh, legal relations. They can appear as persons before the law, if you will, as long as we can establish that uh, their consent was obtained prior to their death. And in this case, when you look at the application, you actually see the signatures and fingerprints of these two deceased migrants, along with the signatures and fingerprints of other applicants. And the other applicants could not be physically present in the court either. In fact, the Italian government basically said that they should not have a legal standing either because there is no way to trace where they are. Right? They are not physically present before the court. The court rejected that reasoning. Why not reject the same reasoning or why not follow uh, the, the same kind of reasoning right, when it comes to migrants who deceased? I think there is a more troubling with this uh, problem, with this denial of legal standing to these two deceased migrants, precisely because we can consider the possibility that it was precisely the border control policies of the Italian state that may have directly or indirectly caused their deaths. I now realize that I forgot to <laughs> click these, but what I would like to suggest is that these migrant deaths could be seen as forced disappearances, right? Think of uh, basically these state policies that push people beyond the pale of the law in both uh, maritime interception which results in death as well as in forced disappearance we are seeing efforts of states to push people beyond the pale of the law and they are making it difficult for their families and friends to locate their whereabouts and the states are trying to render these lives disposable in both cases, basically. So why not think about migrant deaths as forced disappearances? And it would be absurd to suggest that a state can get away with that kind of action as long as there is no victim remaining alive to testify at the end. We would not argue that in the case of forced disappearances. We would allow, basically, uh, the dead to be able to appear as persons before the law. So I was mentioning earlier about the possibility that, uh, you know, when the law unmakes personhood, it basically renders certain human beings non-persons, 
right? In the case of these two deceased migrants, we may say that the court's decision to deny them legal standing effectively turned them into non-persons. And it denied them, if you recall Arendt's argument about personhood as persona, as that artificial mask. It, did, it deprived them of that artificial mask that could have allowed their rights claims to sound through. So that's the first problem that I see with that uh, decision, Hersey case, which is overlooked by many of the uh, analysts uh, examining the case, right? The denial of legal standing to two deceased migrants. But I see also another problem, another crucial problem with the way the ruling was written. When you look at the ruling itself very closely, you realize that it takes the jurisdiction of a state to be essentially territorial. In this particular case, the court argues, we are making an exception to the norm of territorial jurisdiction. In this particular case, the Italian state uh, had effective control over these intercepted migrants because it was the Italian Coast Guard that intercepted them and transferred them to Libyan ships so that they could be taken to Tripoli. So in other words, when the court basically says that territorial jurisdiction is essentially territorial, we are just making an exception, we basically see uh, a different reading of this decision, right? In the sense that uh, it is an exception that would have to be decided in each case again and again, right? And we don't know whether it would be decided in the same way in different case of maritime interception. So it's not a blanket statement against, uh, basically, uh, it's not a blanket statement saying that uh, states cannot engage in these kinds of actions altogether. And I make that last point because when you analyze the ruling again very closely, you see that the court is very differential to state sovereignty and it does not want to control, it does not want to question the state's right to control their borders. The ruling condemns Italy, but it does that without questioning the Italian state's right to control entry into its territory. Italy actually requested that the court should refrain from extending its decisions to border control practices in general. It basically said that the court should focus on the, only on the events of May 6, 2009, right? And not question Italy's powers regarding immigration control. And the court's ruling basically followed that request. And it focuses, it basically says that this ruling applies only to the events of May 6, 2009. Again, it is not a blanket statement about basically application of human rights on the high seas. And as a result of that, as a result of court's ruling basically saying that this is an exception to the norm of territorial jurisdiction, um, we basically see that this decision still leaves migrants intercepted on the high seas with precarious personhood. Remember, I used this term in a very specific way on Tuesday, and I reminded you of the Latin etymology of the term precarious. It basically means obtained by asking, begging, or prayer, hence dependent on another's will. Right? So I'm using the term precarious in order to highlight the uncertainty of rights that are dependent on the favors, privileges, and discretions of another person or authority. Okay. To the extent that human rights litigation takes territorial jurisdiction as the norm in the context of international migration, it risks turning the human rights of intercepted migrants into exceptions to be decided in each case favors or privileges. The critical framework I presented so far emphasizes that the universal personhood guaranteed by the human rights framework does not resolve the paradoxes of human rights examined by Hannah Arendt. So yes, we are living in a different normative, legal and normative landscape compared to the time when Arendt wrote her analysis we have this human rights framework institutionalized now, yet 
we are dealing with very similar paradoxes in many respects. But as I mentioned at the outset, I also want to say that these paradoxes of human rights are not dead ends. And they can be navigated in different ways, in more promising ways, so as to provide more robust guarantees of personhood and fundamental rights to migrants. So with that last point in mind, I would like to turn, to, turn now to the separate opinion prepared in the Hirsi case by the Portuguese judge Polo Sergio Pinto de Albuquerque. Although this is a concurring opinion, right? it's a separate opinion, but it's a concurring opinion. As I said, it was a unanimous decision. The course decision was unanimous. I think the, this concurring opinion diverges significantly from the court's problematic reasoning, especially when it comes to the question of territorial jurisdiction. And perhaps that is not surprising, because the judge uh, actually makes reference to Hannah Arendt's notion of a right to have rights in uh, basically this separate opinion. I didn't have time to basically mention that phrase to you on Tuesday, and I want to briefly explain basically uh, that proposal that we see in Hannah Arendt's analysis of statelessness. She gives us this critical view of human rights, and at the end of that critical analysis, she urges us to rethink human rights in terms of a right to have rights. And when you think about how she examined the plight of rightlessness, you realize that the right to have rights entails a right to legal personhood, right? a right to belong to a political community, and a right to belong to humanity. And the separate opinion of Judge Albuquerque, I think, makes several interventions in the spirit of Hannah Arendt's right to have rights. And for the purpose of this presentation, I will be focusing specifically on how that separate opinion challenges conventional understandings of territorial sovereignty. First of all, very interestingly, the separate opinion um, takes issue with the idea that sovereign rights have a prerogative to control their borders. When you think of a prerogative, it's something that uh, it's, it denotes something absolute. It cannot be questioned. But the judge does not use that term. At, and it's instead, he instead basically reframes uh, border control as a primary state function. And why is that important? I think it's important because the court usually, uh, when it looks at these kinds of migration control practices, it uh, always tries to strike a balance between, on the one hand, the sovereign right to control borders. It uses, the, basically, uh, the term sovereign right. Sometimes it will say even absolute right to control borders. And then, on the other hand, migrants' human rights. And most of the time, it is very likely for migrants to lose in that uh, balancing act, right? But when you use this, uh, when you move away from that language of prerogative or sovereign right, and in this opinion, in the separate opinion, we see the language of primary state function. And the opinion basically emphasizes that this is a primary state function, just like any other function, it has to be regulated by human rights norms. It is subject to the scrutiny of human rights norms. So whereas the court's ruling still puts the burden on migrants to prove that their case deserves an exception to the norm of territorial sovereignty, the separate opinion turns the argument about immigration controls on its head, and it shifts the burden to states by requiring them to make sure that their border control policies are in compliance with human rights norms. As a related point, the court's ruling in the Hersey case approaches the extraterritorialization of migration controls very narrowly. If you remember, uh, I mentioned how basically it applies to only that particular maritime interception that occurred on that specific date, right? It doesn't question all extraterritorial migration controls. 
The separate opinion, on the other hand, points to the need to subject all other forms of extraterritorial migration controls to the scrutiny of human rights norms. Included among these, very interestingly, are the visa decisions at the embassies, for example, or immigration checks at airports, or provision of funds to outsource migration control to countries of origin and transit. As I mentioned, these kinds of border control policies have been considered legitimate forms of state action for a long time now, in accordance with the principle of territorial sovereignty. But going back to the point I made at the outset, these are also the policies that are causing a drastic increase in the number of migrant deaths. And there is no possibility of understanding human rights in terms of what Arendt called the right to have rights, as long as we take these policies to be legitimate, state, uh, legitimate forms of state action. The separate opinion, I think, paves the way for a questioning of, basically, a questioning of the assumption that these are legitimate forms of state ac ac action. And in doing that, I think it goes beyond the confines of the existing international human rights law. And why I say that? So let's focus especially on this argument about the visa decisions. Right? So the separate opinion prepared by Judge Albuquerque, according to that separate opinion, even the visa decisions at the embassy should be subject to the scrutiny of international human rights norms. This is, I think, quite interesting. Because refusal of visa is generally not considered a breach of the principle of non refoulement even when that decision ultimately has the effect of blocking a potential asylum seeker's access to safety. In addition, international law does not establish a positive duty on states to adjust their visa policies in accordance with the right to asylum. So, when the judge basically says that visa decisions should be subject to the scrutiny of human rights norms, I think he is pushing beyond the boundaries of existing framework in important respects. Um, and perhaps because of that, perhaps because the existing framework does not actually provide uh, with. Uh, that does not provide this kind of a strong formulation of the right to asylum. Uh, in the separate opinion, you see Judge Albuquerque referring to some historical examples, perhaps to provide further support for his case. And he invokes here two historical figures who acted in defiance of existing laws uh, to provide visas to stateless persons during World War II. So these are Raul Gustav Wallenberg, he was Sweden's special envoy in Budapest between July and December 1944. And the other one is Aristides de Suso Mendes, the Portuguese consul general from 1938 to 1940 in Bordeaux, France. And the example of Suso Mendes is particularly striking. He refused to follow the 1939 circular in Nazi-occupied uh, France. He procured visas to more than 30,000 people and as a result, as you can anticipate, he, was, he ended up being expelled from his diplomatic career. This is what Judge Albuquerque says about Suso Mendes in his separate opinion. Had this episode taken place today, the Portuguese diplomat would have acted in full accordance with the standard of protection of the European Convention on Human Rights. Indeed, his action would have been the only acceptable response to those in need of international protection. So this is a quote from that separate opinion. I think this is by no means a self-evident conclusion. The protections that the international human rights law affords continue to fall short of what Arendt called the right to have rights. And I'm going to, brief, I'm going to conclude by briefly mentioning that when Arendt proposed to rethink human rights in terms of the right to have rights. She mentioned that this is one right without which no other right can materialize. Right? She also argued that there was no room for this kind of right in international law 
which still operated in terms of the reciprocal agreements and treaties between sovereign states. She highlighted that this right could be guaranteed only by humanity itself. And she also added that it is by no means certain whether that's possible. As we look at the graveyard that is the Mediterranean, it's impossible not to share that uncertainty today. And it's precisely that uncertainty that demands a radical questioning of human rights, a critique that centers on the marginalized people who are at the very borders of these rights. That critique should strive to understand not only the limitations of human rights, but also the possibilities they may offer for rethinking equality beyond its current limitations and borders. Thank you. Okay. This is here. Thank you so much for a brilliant presentation. I um, just wanted to very amicably disagree on the exceptionality of IRC in what the, I think in, on the contrary there is a very uh, um, copious uh, jurisprudence, especially in European courts, about establishing that yes, uh, application of human rights is primarily territorial, but it's primarily, it's not uh, then an exception, it's the, the, there are complementary aspects to it. And I think the jurisprudence establishes a doctrine of jurisdiction by control. And there are special models, meaning uh, in many jurisprudence, like Cyprus against Turkey, with the occupation of, uh, of the northern part of Cyprus, uh, the Russian in Moldova, Katan against Moldova, where they establish that whether it's military occupation, whether it's territorial uh, control by another country like Guantanamo, etc., we can establish that jurisdiction apply. So it's not exceptionally, that's the model. And then the personal model, which is control over a person, whether it's in custody, in detention, or otherwise in operation of law enforcement abroad. Then you have al Skeini, you have Ocalan case against Turkey, etc. So there is, I think, a very uh, uh, good corpus of jurisprudence and the, the general comment 31 of the Human Rights Committee which stated that jurisdictions apply where the state exercises power and um, effective control over the person. And as specifically you mentioned, regardless whether the person is an asylum seeker, stateless, uh, refugees, etc., etc. So I think we, 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 we are now, uh, I think, personally able to say that there is a jurisdiction by control. There is no more exceptionality <laughs> to that, even in the ICs, and there are, there are other uh, um, pieces of jurisprudence, but I think uh, Guy goodwin Gill said in 2014 with the 20th anniversary of the sale case was the case in the Supreme Court denying application of the non-refoulement principle in the Haitian interdictions. Mm -hmm. He said there is no place on the planet, and I think even beyond, that where the rule of law does not apply. And so back to your argument, which you finished with about equality, I was, uh, my question comes now, is mm -hmm. how much you think like the right on non-discrimination and equality before the law it's an, uh, are rights that apply irrespective of territorial scope. So things that apply as uh, customer international law, irrespective whether you have signed the conventions of human rights, mm -hmm. and, and so they apply also in the high seas so or in this terra nullius that are the transit zones in airports and et cetera. So mm -hmm. whether these two very elements, which are custom international law, would apply everywhere in respective of mm -hmm. the place uh, where you are. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Thank you for your lecture and uh, you told, you mentioned that the uh, refugee, uh, sorry, but the humans have a right to belong to a political community. But however, even as refugees, they don't have voices because they cannot vote. Uh, how they will you develop a sense of belonging? Uh, is it enough to be recognized as refugees to develop the sense of belonging?
and love and justice. Should I answer yes. these two? Okay, thank you very much for these questions. They are great. So in response to Marco, um, I think we disagree uh, <laughs> in the sense that uh, the language of exceptionality is in the ruling itself in the Hirsi ruling, Hirsi Jema and others, uh, when the court says, you know, we are making an exception to the norm of territorial jurisdiction, right? I agree with you that there is, when you look at basically the European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence, you do uh, see uh, this idea of jurisdiction as control over persons, right? But I think in the migration cases, the court is very, very careful to basically repeat that jurisdiction is by definition, you know, territorial. We are making an exception here. And uh, there is something unique about migration control cases. To make things even more complicated, once you have a case such as Hersi, where the court basically says control over persons would actually constitute jurisdiction as well, right? Now, you know, states uh, can engage in um, actions where it is much more difficult to establish that kind of control. Right? You outsource uh, border control to private actors uh, and you basically make it much, uh, you have a much longer chain of responsibility so that it becomes more and more difficult to basically say, well, it was the Italian government, it was the Italian Coast Guard that basically put people on the ship. So I think uh, even, you know, when we basically turn to an understanding of jurisdiction as control over persons, I don't think it, all, it solves all these paradoxes that I have been talking about. And in terms of uh, basically your question about whether the principle of non-discrimination, for instance, should, shouldn't it apply everywhere? I agree. That's basically uh, what I was trying to say. Um, the principle of universal personhood would suggest that uh, the principle of non-discrimination should apply anywhere. But I'm trying to understand how that universalistic um, premise is constantly undermined or weakened by another principle uh, that organizes the international system, and that's the principle of territorial sovereignty. It is also the principle within the human rights framework. So uh, we cannot have human rights protection without the agreement of sovereign states. That's why Arendt says, right, it's very uncertain whether this is possible as long as we work within the framework of international law that is still based on treaties between sovereign states. So I'm, I think, more skeptical, unfortunately. Um, with regards to uh, your question, an uh, excellent question about, you know, the right to belong to political community, this is, I think, crucial uh, for understanding some of the limitations of uh, the existing human rights framework. Um, when Arendt proposes rethinking uh, human rights in terms of the right to have rights, she puts specific emphasis on this political dimension, and especially important, perhaps even more important than voting. Voting would be one example of this, is to be able to have your uh, actions and opinions taken into account. Right? It is very difficult to do that without citizenship status. It is very difficult to do that without uh, political rights. But we are seeing also various kinds of um, activism um, by uh, refugees, asylum seekers, undocumented immigrants, uh, where they are trying to render their voices to be uh, uh, render their voices audible. Right? Render their claims. Uh, visible uh, in the eyes of a society that is trying to render them completely invisible. So I think there are possibilities, but the status, the precarious status, uh, makes it more difficult compared to, let's say, a citizen exercising these kinds of rights. Any other questions? Do you have more questions? Um, I was thinking um, that uh, in, in some ways uh, we all 
experience um, when you go to a country and you get to the immigration. Mm -hmm. um, or in fact, if you consider even your flight, you mm -hmm. know, uh, during the time of displacement, okay, mm -hmm. when you're no longer uh, in the sovereign state you left and you are going to another sovereign state and when you get to the... Um, this is something I was thinking while you were talking because I never thought in that terms so I'm still, <laughs> I'm still thinking while I speak so bear with me. Cool. So uh, it's, it's just that we are, you, you, we in a way um, conscious or not, we are more um, familiar with this experience than we, we realize. Mm -hmm. Because really, uh, at that point, and, and, and even more interesting that the representation of the sovereign state will be that, work, that, that person that is working in immigration at that moment, uh, he represents the border, and the sovereignty, mm -hmm. and um, he is he's going to decide if you're going to entry or not. No. So uh, in some ways, the mask, mm -hmm. during this time, the, is, this, is, is, um, is almost like if the mask is suspended, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, during this, this period, the mask, mm -hmm. which is the, all these mm -hmm. rights, or the, the mask of the persona, mm -hmm. is, is suspended. Yeah. And that, um, you know, <laughs> something okay. like that. Yeah. And the, the other thing is that I uh, was going to ask you, if, if, if you we manage to, to carry on a case um, a fall, you know, to higher and higher courts, uh, if it was possible, okay, a, a case like that, and could we end up um, getting to a, a court like higher, you know, uh, um, in the sense that this could be seen as crimes against humanity? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, anyway, yeah. um, I don't know if you Excellent. understand the last yes. question I can... Excellent uh, questions. I can, I can Excellent questions. Hi, um, thanks for your uh, brilliant exposition. It was really good and a pleasure listening to you. I was um, uh, thinking about what you were uh, raising on, on rightlessness and just remembering Arendt's point on um, how critical is the situation when uh, being a criminal would be more favorable for the person uh, and I think that uh, maybe apply to your description on Mediterranean as a graveyard and the consequences of uh, your legal critique. So I would uh, be tempted to hear more from you because I uh, see your uh, maybe uh, radical reading of Arendt as a very powerful uh, pathway to uh, rethink um, human rights uh, law. Um, but uh, it is uh, really uh, uh, frustrated, uh, frustrating, as you have pointed out. Uh, you know, it's difficult not to have a grim uh, conclusion uh, when you, we think about the political context where uh, uh, this debate is uh, uh, happening right now. So mm -hmm. I wonder um, how, how would you um, um, portray the, the current uh, uh, context what, where uh, we are discussing this, because mm -hmm. this is not a, 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 a phenomena restricted uh, uh, to Europe uh, yeah. or the US, it seems that it's really uh, once again, the zeitgeist, uh, and mm -hmm. there is a new uh, discourse, uh, kind of a, a right-wing populist discourse that is uh, uh, reshaping the way we we talk about uh, 
immigration and asylum. So um, I would, I would uh, be tempted to ask you, how do you see uh, Arendt's um, um, political philosophy um, as uh, uh, an interesting um, um, uh, way to, to read and to um, uh, think about how to counter that at the more uh, political level in the sense that somehow maybe uh, traditional liberal response uh, uh, has a limitation when we have to um, counter all those challenges that not only migrants and, and, and refugees are facing, but even defenders, uh, even activists, mm -hmm. NGOs are as well somehow being criminalized when they stand in defense of those uh, populations, uh, stateless mm -hmm. people, migrants and refugees. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, what happens is that it seems that this precarious position can be uh, somehow shifted huh? and mm -hmm. uh, uh, hospitality itself can in the end be criminalized. So I wonder how do you see that uh, in your analysis of uh, mm -hmm. rightlessness um, in, in this mm -hmm. uh, political context that we have to face today. Thank you. We go ahead the third one and then we finish this block. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Excellent. Thank you, Professor, for your lecture. Uh, I have a curiosity about uh, what was the outcome of this decision of the, the committee. And even though it's uh, an exceptional how this, what are the reflexes that this decision brings to human rights as a whole? Thank you very much for these excellent questions. There is no way that I can answer them adequately in the remaining time, but I will try very, very briefly so in terms of the first question that you had, great question about whether this is, you know, an experience that is actually familiar to, uh, to all of us uh, in some respects when we, you know, travel from one sovereign state to another and arrive at an airport and face the immigration officer don't we have a suspension of our legal standing in some respects? I would say partly yes but uh, I say partly because I want to emphasize that not everyone is equally vulnerable in this way. Because when you use a term such as precarious, right, this is a term that is used by many scholars, it, uh, uh, there is always the risk that we will turn it into a general human condition of vulnerability. And I want to basically show, I want to highlight how law uh, produces subjects differently, how law applies to different categories of subjects differently, and uh, how, for instance, race matters in terms of whether your legal personhood is uh, suspended or denied or ev evaded. So I want to uh, emphasize differential treatment before the law in many respects. And uh, with regards to your second question about, you know, whether it would be possible to think of this at even a higher level as a crime against humanity, I think that also will, the answer that I will give to that question overlaps with the answer that I would like to briefly give to Gabriel. We will talk more. Um, there was recently a report uh, by, prepared by the UN Special Rapporteur Agnes Kalemar a very interesting report on, that basically invites us to rethink migrant deaths as extrajudicial killings that should be tried at the International Criminal Court. So you were referring to the International Criminal Court. I believe this may be the first time that uh, a UN uh, uh, official is making this kind of a um, uh, proposal related to migrant deaths. So it is really worth looking at it. But it also shows that even when we are working within the existing human rights framework, existing international framework, there may be much more imaginative ways to 
mobilize that framework. That's one of the reasons why I turned at the end of my analysis to the separate opinion b prepared by the Portuguese judge in the Hersey case. I think that takes us beyond uh, existing human rights framework by using that framework itself very interestingly, and I'm interested in those kinds of possibilities uh, very much. And with regards to the final question about the outcome of decision, as I said, I don't want to underestimate the significance of this decision, because one of the things that, um, you know, that I take uh, from uh, Hannah Arendt is that uh, we are never in control of how uh, our words and deeds will be interpreted right, uh, or will be taken up by others. So there is the possibility that this decision, although it's limited, uh, as I tried to highlight, can be taken up in different ways, let's say in a different court case, right, there is that kind of possibility. Or it can be maybe become site of uh, new forms of activism going beyond the uh, space of the court, right? So I'm interested in those kinds of possibilities as well. Uh, so uh, right now we see basically the non-governmental organizations and international organizations uh, interested in the um, rights of uh, advocating the rights of migrants and refugees. They welcome this case and they use it to basically highlight that uh, states cannot deny uh, these rights, fundamental rights on the high seas. They cannot turn the high seas into a lawless zone. And I think that kind of, it has its limits, but that is uh, also important as an outcome. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions. And uh, I would love to continue the conversation during the coffee break. I guess we will have a brief one. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, então, 15 minutes of coffee break, então, OK?
Battista.
Vamos, vamos. Ok, então, no, mais um convidado internacional, James Holyfield, Jim Holyfield. Eu tive o prazer de ter na minha meu jurado de tese de doutorado e que agora vem nos agraciar com essa palestra. Ele é professor em Tower Center da SMU. Ele tem dois livros clássicos que eu gosto muito, que é o Theory of Migration, Migration Theory, e Control of Migration, as well, que é um clássico. Então, passo a palavra a James Holyfield. I assume everyone can hear me, and looks like... Uh, We may have a problem because everybody's still out having coffee right now. <laughs> so maybe we should wait for one minute for people to come back in. What do you think? Uh, I like these long uh, Brazilian coffee breaks here. <laughs> But as you know, I'm a college professor, so when I begin my lectures, I like for the students to be in the classroom. <laughs> okay. Well, it's an incredible pleasure for me to be back here with, in Brazil, my third visit to Brazil in my career. Uh, the last time I was here, I was actually participating in a 
a doctoral dissertation defense <laughs> uh, as an examiner for uh, uh, Professor Gomes. I call him Professor. He's my colleague now, working with me on many projects. And, but he was once my student. So uh, as any professor, I'm always very pleased to see you know, students who are so successful and so uh, making a big mark on the field. Uh, as, as Charles is. Um, but thank you very much for hosting me today. Um, I was asking someone up, up on the front row here, I, I got the impression that m many of you in the room are lawyers. Uh, someone told me that was not necessarily the case. <laughs> uh, a lot of you are in social work, some of you are in different academic disciplines coming from NGOs. So. Um, you will see in this lecture, um, I'm really going to talk to you about more about the politics of migration, international migration, uh, and especially about the state. We heard a lot of discussion in the previous lecture about the state, and I think we will have many things to, uh, to discuss about this. But uh, I'm going to talk about a concept that I've been pushing for some time, which I call the migration state. And I'll explain what I mean about that in just a moment. And I also want to talk about the dilemmas of migration governance. And I think uh, uh, my colleague previously illustrated many of these dilemmas and paradoxes in her own discussion. But here is the agenda for the talk, or the lecture, if you will. Uh, I want to begin by talking about migration and globalization. I was discussing with John on the front row here earlier about this whole idea of a crisis. Um, we always are in sort of crisis mode or crisis thinking. Uh, I want to take a little bit of distance from this crisis idea. Um, and. Here I will talk about what I call the migration state uh, and the liberal paradox, you know, which reflects very much the previous lecture. You know, our societies are built, many of them on these liberal principles, and migration uh, propose, you know, poses many dilemmas. You know, it really is a paradox. Uh, then I will talk more about the dilemmas of migration control. And finally, I think we're all very concerned about whether we are reaching a turning point in world politics and world history, maybe the end of what I call the liberal interregnum, that rather than expanding human rights, moving away from this extraterritoriality, maybe we're going in the other direction now. I mean, clearly the election of Donald Trump, President of the United States, the U.S. is abdicating its responsibilities now in this area, and Trump wants to lead the U.S. in a completely different direction. So uh, we want to talk a little bit about these four things. Uh, so looking at this migration issue and globalization, a sense of crisis, question mark. Uh, some of you may have seen this, these numbers already. Uh, but I, I often begin lecturing about migration by pointing out that um, there are about, I think the latest numbers are 244 million people living outside of the country in which they were born. 244 million. Uh, that is a little over 3% of the world's population. So where's the crisis here? <laughs> Most people stay pretty close to where they were born. They don't travel. They don't migrate. Um, if you ask people, I, you, you maybe do some surveys in Brazil, it's been done in the US, asking people how many people are living outside of their country, moving. My students say, oh, a billion. <laughs> you know, 20% of the pop world's population. But it's actually a pretty, pretty small number. So, you know, from a I think a social science standpoint, you could ask yourself the question, why are more people not moving? Because the forces driving people to move are actually very strong. Uh, this is just another way of illustrating it. And 
Unfortunately, look at Latin America. <laughs> Latin America is not a region <laughs> of in-migration. Uh, Latin America has been a region of out-migration. Of course, the U.S., which is the largest receiver of immigrants really on the planet, Europe, and of course, you can see here the Middle East, the countries of the Gulf. So I, I try to be careful about how to say this. We're not talking about immigration necessarily. If you look at the countries in the Gulf, these are not immigrants. They might be migrants, but they have no rights. Uh, they are there you know, purely at the invitation of the Gulf countries. We can come back and talk about that as well. Of course, Australia. And I just recently wrote an article about Japan. Japan, I would argue, is becoming very much an immigration country, an immigration state. Um, so again, this is just a, a way to look at the levels of foreign population, percentage of the population. Australia very high, Canada very high. These are countries, a little surprising to see Austria so high, the US sort of in the middle and so forth, Italy further down at the end here. So uh, roughly 10% of these uh, countries, 10% of the population is foreign born. So it looks like a lot of people, but they are pretty heavily concentrated in certain states. Uh, where is the crisis? Okay, well here, this was, you could argue, a crisis. Because if you look at refugee flows into Europe in 2015, 2016, you have this enormous spike in people coming in, uh, reaching uh, almost a million people coming in, over a million people coming in in one year period as refugees. And this was a shock. You know, it was a difficult situation for the Europeans. Um, I will argue that the Germans really were the heroes in this, uh, in this crisis. So, you know, we can discuss that as well. But, you know, you could say this, this certainly was a crisis. Look at the United States. These are refugee flows into the United States. <laughs> Very small, manageable, 70, 75,000 a year coming in for a country as big as the United States. These numbers are quite manageable. Of course, if you go back to this period, does anyone know what was happening here? That was the last time you had a migration crisis in America. Who were these people? Uh, there were some Cubans, that's true, but that's, they were only a, a small part of the group. I'll give you a hint. Uh, refugees often come from places of conflict <laughs> where major powers have been involved, heavily involved, where they're coming from Vietnam, <laughs> from Southeast Asia. Millions, millions. So this shows you also, I think, the colonial, neo-colonial, <laughs> imperial connections with respect to migration. Same is true in Europe. I mean, Europeans have a deep, deep history you know, cultural, strong cultural relationship with African nations, Middle Eastern nations. So not surprisingly, the refugees are coming to Europe. Just as these refugees from Southeast Asia were flooding into the United States. So that was the last time you saw a major refugee crisis in America. So is this, you know, are we in a crisis? I want to keep asking you that question and maybe, maybe you all can have, we can have a discussion about this afterwards. Um, in Europe, we can see, and I'm going to talk quite a bit about Europe in this lecture, shifting narratives and policies. Um, if you look back at the history of migration in the post-war period, uh, you can basically divide this period along several lines. First of all, there was the guest worker period, driven by the need for labor. Uh, I'll illustrate this more in just a moment. Then you have the period uh, of the closing off of the guest worker migration, which is followed by large family migration in Europe. And this question of family unification became an issue of human rights inscribed into 
the European system. You can't prevent the families from reunifying and living together. Um, then you have an attempt to slow down, shut down legal immigration. Uh, the next wave comes largely as refugees and asylum seekers, which is what we still see today uh, in Europe. But if you look at the narratives, you know, in Germany, the argument was Deutschland ist kein Einwanderungsland. <laughs> Germany can never be a country of immigration. It's a, it's a country of outmigration. The Germans have gone all around the world. Uh, but we know that by the 1990s, you know, this was simply denying reality. <laughs> Germany had become de facto a country of immigration. And the Germans had to change their laws to deal with this. So one question you can ask yourself, think about Brazil today. Uh, and I'll try to illustrate this later in my talk. Many countries are in a transition from being countries of outmigration to becoming countries of in-migration and settlement. So if you want to see how one country dealt with this, look at the German case. And of course, we know that the Germans were Angela Merkel, the German chancellor, she said, wir schaffen das. You know, we can manage this crisis. This is what Germany is about. It's what Europe is about. We, we must be able to take care of these refugees. Otherwise, we are, we are denying the fundamental principles of our society and our politics. But once she opened the door, many, many people came, not surprisingly. And wir schaffen das, we can do this, became schaffen wir das. You know, can we actually do this? Can we manage this? And you, you know, she paid a heavy political price for this. She said, if we rescue the banks, we can save the refugees. You know, she helped to stabilize the euro, to stabilize the banks. Now we must do the same for the refugees, she said. So this was redemption for Germany. A remarkable humanitarian response, almost one million arrivals in Germany in 2015. But of course we know Germany could not manage this problem unilaterally. They had to stop it. They had to stop the flows. Uh, and they would turn to Turkey. That was the only option really left for them. What was Merkel's mistake? What mistake did she make? I don't think opening the borders was a mistake. I don't think she had any choice. As one German diplomat said to me, a very high-ranking diplomat in Washington, we have 100, 200,000 people sitting in the mud, in the rain, on the border. What are we going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do with them? <laughs> and imagine if Germany had put them in camps, or if Germany had turned them away. This would be a political disaster. So she had to open the border. But what was her mistake? <laughs> she thought, Marco, she thought the other Europeans would help, that they would follow. <laughs> she was wrong. Not only did the, the other Europeans, they didn't help, many of them turned their back on her and her problems. It certainly took the pressure off of Italy for a while, for a while. Uh, this is just a picture of me standing in front of a, uh, a poster, uh, which some of you may know the German. Die größte Katastrophe ist das Vergessen. The biggest catastrophe for us is to forget. Germany was a country full of refugees, asylum seekers. So this is from Caritas, from Caritas, reminding the Germans, <laughs> we have a special moral responsibility for dealing with this refugee crisis. But of course, I was thinking of my colleague's presentation earlier, if you expand the rights and you open the borders, the danger of moral hazard. Everyone understand that expression? I'm looking up at the interpreter up here. I don't know how to say it in Brazilian or in Spanish, but moral hazard is like, it's like an insurance policy. When you tell people that you will under, underwrite the risk, that it's worth taking the risk to make this long and dangerous move, of course, you are encouraging more risky behavior. 
So this is a fundamental problem for the state. It's a dilemma. What do you do? You open the borders, too many people come. It's dangerous for the migrants to make this journey. This is just another picture of the German chancellor, the Schaffendas. We can do this. That became <laughs> the expression of the day. Well, let's shift now, and I want to talk to you about what I call the migration state. John and some others, and I can't remember your young colleague who was helping me, uh, where he is in the audience here, but uh, had been reading about this idea of the migration state and the liberal paradox. So let's, let's just think about where are we today in looking at the state? What is the responsibility of the state? Uh, I think Aitan did a fantastic job illustrating this in her own talk. Here is the scheme in my work, my recent work. The state, I would argue, has evolved over several centuries. The state began, the state was created as a security state, a garrison state. That's why we have the state. The state was invented to stop the killing in Europe. Quis regio jus religio, <laughs> for those of you who study international relations. Remember the, the Augsburg Treaty and the Peace of Westphalia. This was to stop the killing between the Protestants and the Catholics. That's why the state came into existence. Allowing each state to make a decision about its own religion, its own population. So you have these two principles. Sovereignty. States are sovereign. They have the right to control the territory and the border. And non-interference. Other states must stop interfering in the internal affairs. So don't meddle in the religious issues in the neighboring state. So that's the garrison state. It was an absolutist state. It was an author authoritarian, autocratic state. And the principle was security. The individuals were subjects, subjects of the crown, of the sovereign. Go back and read Thomas Hobbes. If you haven't, uh, you'll see this very clearly in Hobbes. Um, but in the 18th and 19th century, the state began to take on very new functions. It was important for the state to manage the economy. And an American political scientist named Richard Rosecrans called it the trading state. So you've got to manage economic relations. You have a, an economic revolution that occurred in the 17th and 18th and 19th century. A liberal revolution, opening up markets, laissez-faire, free trade, managing the money, managing the economy. This became the responsibility of the state. And of course, we know that Great Britain would be the, the leader in creating this new international liberal economic order. But as we move into the 20th and especially the 21st century, the state now begins to take on a very new function. It is becoming a migration state, which means it must worry about who is in and who is out, because it's also a welfare state. And a welfare state cannot be open too much because it might undermine the social contract and the provision of welfare for the citizens of the state. And of course, the new mantra of the state, Aitan, its rights. Rights become the key for the migration state. If you don't remember anything else from this lecture, <laughs> remember that. Rights are key. That is absolutely essential in the liberal state. And the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights begins to codify this. So what is a migration state? It's a state that is open to immigration, immigration and returns. So the migration state function, the governing, the managing of migration, it's, a, it's, a, it's even more important for the sending states and societies. They also have this responsibility, this function, uh, as it is for the receiving states. 
It's a state which manages mobility, allowing people to move and regulating migration to maximize benefits, to minimize the cost. More and more states have to think about this trade-off and about these issues. There are gains for the receiving state, obviously. Canada is a perfect example. There are gains for the sending state, the Philippines. If you want to think of the two great migration states in the world today, one is Canada, <laughs> the other is the Philippines. We can talk about Australia too if you want. Where does Australia fit? And it's a state which clearly defines the status, the rights of foreigners. Uh, if the state fails, if it fails to, to protect the rights of migrants, uh, it is going to be a failing state in terms of the migration function. That's a very, very hard thing for politicians to accept. Uh, and a state which has legal provisions for settlement, naturalization, citizenship, and I would argue return migration. Those are the, that's how you define the migration state. If you just, if I stop for a minute and let you look at this, is Brazil a migration state? Is it becoming a migration state? This would be a question. Um, so obviously the state needs legal capacity. It has to have institutional and legal capacity. The quantity and the quality of rights, safe and orderly migration, the key to the global compact, obviously, migration, market-based management of migration, and a key point here, willingness to participate in regional and international migration regimes. This is, when I talk about the migration state, this is what I'm talking about. And this is what the state must look like in the 21st century. Um, and if the state fails in these functions, then it causes many problems, many unintended consequences. I'll illustrate that more in just a moment. Is the United States a migration state? Yes, it is on one dimension. The U.S. has highly developed legal immigration policies. Over one million people immigrate to the United States legally each year. We have policies for human capital, the H-1B. I don't know how many people in this audience are holders of an H-1B visa. Maybe not many of you. Some of you might be aspiring to have an H-1B visa. But on another dimension, the U.S. is a very much a failed migration state because we have now very high levels of illegal immigration, 10 to 12 million people living in the United States without status. That is undermining the social contract. It is hurting the migrants. It is hurting American society, hurting American democracy. Uh, if you pay attention to the election of Donald Trump, this was a big theme, constant reference to the migrants, to the illegal migrants. But if you look at this expression here, and I, I meant to look it up in German, but one of my favorite expressions comes from the Swiss novelist Max Fritsch. In the 1970s, he said simply, we asked for workers, we needed workers in Switzerland, but people, people came instead. I think the German translation is human beings came. Menschen, Menschen. <laughs> it was human beings who came. So how do you deal with this fact that the workers, I think Karl Marx explained something about the commodification of labor. Workers are not pure commodities. And I will stress today and tomorrow, if you want to talk to your friends about this or your students, or colleagues, just remind them that people, people are not shirts. <laughs> they are not shirts. They, they cannot be traded like a pure commodity because they come with a package of rights. Think about this. So now to look at the dilemmas of migration control. The dilemmas, because Aiten 
maybe tonight at dinner we can have this discussion, but, but s the states, they are trapped <laughs> on the horns of a very difficult dilemma, a very difficult paradox. This is the paradox. I wish I could bring Aten back up here to <laughs> discuss this. <laughs> In a liberal economy, the state has to have be open. And we can discuss this if you like, but one of the great things about these open economies and open societies is the tremendous energy, the talent, the entrepreneurial spirit, the basic work labor that comes from migration. States that are closed to migration they are not going to have successful dynamic economies. So you need to be open to migration. But the political logic of the liberal state is one of closure. You have to know who are your citizens and those who are not your citizens. Otherwise, the social contract is in danger. So this is a paradox. And liberal states have to find a way to strike a balance between openness and closure. And to give away my, my punchline, my conclusion, you cannot strike that balance unless rights are respected. Rights have, are key. They are key to the, to the paradox. And it's very hard for politicians to accept that. If you want to, for teaching purposes, this is the way I describe immigration politics in most societies. And I don't know if there are any politicians in the audience here, maybe not. But migration is a politician's worst nightmare. It's a nightmare. Un <laughs> cauchemar, as the French would say. Because it is so complicated. You can have a debate about markets and about rights. In the normal time, you can say, how many migrants do we need? What, what skills should they have? How old should they be? Should we let the families come in? Should, what kind of citizenship? Should, how long should they wait for citizenship? Do we give them citizenship? That's a very normal debate. But as we know, the debate becomes much more complicated when you have a security dynamic. All it takes in Germany, Germany which did such a great job in handling the refugees, and you have one, one Tunisian asylum seeker who was admitted by Italy, who makes it to Germany, who goes to Berlin, drives a truck and kills a dozen people. You have 19 young men, mostly Saudis, with box cutters, who knocked down the two buildings, the two buildings, the World Trade Towers in New York City. Suddenly the security dynamic is there. And the garrison state, if my state is not protecting me, then it's failing. So the danger, the fear, if you, if you add to this a cultural fear, as we see today, in the world today, there's a very powerful Islamophobia, a fear of the other. And of course, this resurrects all of the, the history of the struggle between Islam and Christianity. It brings back all of the ghosts of the past. And politicians sometimes are very clever at taking advantage of this. So, migration politics is a four-dimensional game. Have you ever played chess? Think of playing chess on one dimension, or maybe two dimensions. Try playing a game that has four different dimensions. It is very, very hard to do. And it's a, it's a game that is happening on th at least three levels. Of course, the game is being played on the national level. Think of the Brazilian debates. But the game is being played right here in Rio. In the, in the level of the city, and the town, and the neighborhood. And of course, 
everything the state does with respect to migration, it has big foreign policy implications. <laughs> so it's, it's happening on the international level. So this is a four-dimensional game that is being played on three levels. That will give you a headache, a headache. <laughs> Think about it. If you're a politician, what do you do? So I'm going to go a little bit faster here. I mentioned the U.S. and Canada, uh, Europe. There's a lot of convergence, I think, going on. At least there was a lot of convergence in policies and politics. Now we may be seeing a new divergence. Uh, the U.S. and Canada, Australia, these are nations of immigrants. Like Brazil, someone mentioned this earlier, settler societies. Uh, Europe, thinking of itself as an out-migration country. Think of Portugal. You know, Portugal sending people all over the world. Now Portugal is an immigration country. It has changed. Um, you have the rise of the welfare state. And you have the problem of how do you make the policy work, the goal, objective of the policy, the outcome of the policy. Um, I'm referring to a book here uh, about controlling immigration. I don't have time to, to go through all of the different national stories, the national myths about immigration. As someone alluded to this earlier in the talk. What is the Brazilian myth? <laughs> You know, what is the national idea of Brazil? Brazil has an idea. It has an ideology. And the national ideology is critical. If you're going to have a lot of immigrants coming in, you have to know who you are. And you have to be secure enough in your own identity to accept the people, the others who are coming in. I once had a colleague in New York City who is a Marxist theorist and I said you know the myth the myth is very important and of course being a good Marxist he said a myth a myth has nothing to do with anything everything is material it all comes back to material interests so I come back to my home university talk to my co-author my great colleague cultural anthropologist Caroline Bertel and I said you know this guy in New York said the myths are unimportant and she's an anthropologist and she said is he crazy <laughs> all of human behavior <laughs> is driven by myths they are so powerful the myths you know what is the Brazilian myth you know what is the uh, Canadian myth what's the German myth the Germans had a myth they had an idea called the Volk the Volksgemeinschaft that was the myth in Germany modern Germany Society is built, the community is built around the people, the folk. The people are people of German blood. Of course, we know the Volksgemeinschaft was destroyed by the Nazis. Germany was crushed, defeated, so the Germans had to find a new myth. I don't know if anyone can think about what is the new German myth. It, the German myth in the 50s and 60s with the guest workers, it became the myth of the Wirtschaftswunder, <laughs> the economic miracle, West Germany rising, you know, like a phoenix <laughs> from the ashes of the war and defeat. So this became the myth around which the Germans are thinking about how do we become an immigration country. The German Chancellor Helmut Kohl said, we must accept the Turks. We have to accept these people because they helped with the the Wirtschaftswunder, the economic miracle, and so forth. Here's the book. I think John was asking about books to read. This is one I would recommend to you. Uh, Charles actually had a chapter in the second edition of this book. So these, are, these things are discussed, all of the immigration countries. And of course, you can see the picture here. It was a nice picture for the cover. This is on the beach in San Diego. And you can see the small kids, the boys, with their, their arms reaching through the, uh, the barrier, through the wall. I love this poster here. <laughs> I don't, I'm sorry to, this, this talk has become so focused on Germany, but uh, I was giving a talk about this in Mexico City to a German foundation, 
and they were very shocked by this poster. Can anyone translate this? I don't know the translator. Maybe I should say what it says. It says, for 60, for 60 marks, you can buy an Italian. <laughs> Marco, 60 marks, are you ready? <laughs> so you want the markets, how the markets work here. This is the German guest worker. Look at the Italian men. Look at all these Italian men. Ready, ready to go to Germany, to work in Germany for 60 marks. That's cheap, right? <laughs> Back in the 50s. These are Turkish workers, <laughs> the Gastarbeiter. Look at them working in the mines, working in the factories in Germany. Are they going to become German? <laughs> Do they become German? This, of course, is a picture today from the fields in California. Why do we have such nice vegetables and fruits that are very well cultivated, harvested, and cheap? Because we have lots of illegal Mexican and Central American labor. So should these people be given rights and citizenship? They have made a contribution. <laughs> just like the guest workers in Germany. Should we give them rights? Should we give them citizenship? This is the debate going on right now in America. So to come back to Europe, obviously the need for a common European policy. And I would just stop for a moment and stress for you, um, I think Europe is the most advanced region of the world today for dealing with migration. More advanced, I would say, than the United States. Maybe the Canadians, because the Europeans have thought so hard <laughs> about this question about rights. And how do you cooperate? Tomorrow, I will talk about the problem of co cooperation in international relations. That's my lecture for tomorrow. And I will talk about migration and development. But how do you build a common policy for controlling immigration and dealing with refugees? Uh, I don't have time to go into the details here. But we're happy to come back to it in the discussion. Obviously, the Europeans have a border-free region called the Schengen, which is the most advanced form of migration cooperation in the world. The Schengen countries have open borders. I'm probably one of the only people in this room who's old enough to remember <laughs> when you crossed the borders in Europe, you had to show your papers. You couldn't travel. This is one of the four freedoms of the European Union. The freedom of mobility to move around. Uh, and of course, we know the Europeans also had a refugee policy. This is the so-called Dublin Convention. Uh, this policy fell apart. It literally fell apart. Uh, it was never a very good policy. Marco, I'd really like to hear your thoughts about Dublin, but it was basically the price the Italians, the Greeks, and others paid to be good Europeans, to be the buffer frontline states, while the Northern Europeans could say, ah, this is not our problem. Because those people, they are entering on your territory. You are responsible for them. Remember, where you first arrive, that's where you have to ask for asylum. And of course, the Italians, being very clever, said, well, that's the way north. <laughs> you want to go to Germany, Belgium? Be my guest. <laughs> so the policy didn't work. It fell apart. And of course, here is a, a vivid illustration. But for those of you who do international relations, this is what is called suasion. These are games that nations play where they pressure, persuade other states to manage the problem for them. Turkey was basically bribed to stop the flows from the Middle East and South Asia and Africa. Now we see, as Aitan pointed out, the flows have come back to the central Mediterranean with the deaths in Italy and even Spain. Even Spain is now, because the Turks 
took the deal. They stopped the flows. Uh, the United States did the same thing with Mexico. We put enormous pressure on Mexican government to stop the Central American children from coming north. These are the games, the suasion games, trying to, in the absence of a policy, you are getting, forcing your neighbors to solve the problem for you. Uh, of course, there are a lot of long-term policy issues here about the integration of refugees, markets and rights. The silver lining is that Europe needs people, it needs talent, it needs workers. Europe, of course, has gone through a very big demographic transition. The European societies are stagnant, birth rates very low, so they desperately need people. But there is a political and cultural backlash. The undermining of Schengen and, of course, the British departure from the European Union. And the main reason many of the British voted to leave the European Union was because of migration. Item. They want to reassert their sovereignty. That's what the British voters were saying. We cannot be held hostage by the European Court of Human Rights. This is a violation of British sovereignty. So again, the search for a common European policy. Um, these are just some numbers, interesting numbers. If you look at native and foreign-born for, uh, employment rates for natives here, foreign-born here, and you look at the difference between the two, this is a very interesting chart because it shows you that the social democratic welfare states like Denmark, uh, Sweden, the foreigners are not getting jobs, they're not being employed at a fast rate. But look at Italy, look at the United States. The rate of participation in the labor force is higher than the native born people. So if you are an immigrant in the United States or in Italy, you're working <laughs> because you have a large informal sector. Uh, not so easy in the northern social democracies. So I'm almost to the end and we'll take some questions, but clearly we've entered a new phase in politics in the Western democracies, uh, what I would call reactive populism, the desire on the part of many people to turn the clock back, let's go back to a different time when there were no immigrants. Um, and we need to get rid of this liberal idea, get rid of human rights, stop collaborating and cooperating. Donald Trump has withdrawn the United States from the Global Compact. His ambassador to the UN, who seems to be quite an intelligent lady, Ms. Haley, Ambassador Haley, announced that control of migration is a sovereign question for the United States. The, US, the United States will not participate in these liberal international arrangements. So we're back to security and cultural concerns. I mentioned the terrorist attack. Don't forget about the revolt of the East Europeans. The East Europeans said, no, 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 no. <laughs> we do not want to help. We will not accept Muslim refugee asylum seekers. This is your problem. You made this problem in Western Europe because of your colonial imperial policies. We have nothing to do with it. We are Christian nations. We cannot accept Muslim refugees in Hungary or Poland. This is the so-called Visegrad group. Uh, did you know that the, the Hungarian, for, uh, Hungarian Prime Minister, Viktor Orban, he accused Germany of moral imperialism. Moral imperialism. Trying to make <laughs> the other Europeans accept responsibility for the refugees. Of course, we have Islamophobia, we have Trump, and for the first time in the U.S. in a long time, 
We're going back to politicization of refugee policy. It's become a political football. We moved away from that in the 80s and 90s and 2000s. Now we have made it, once again, a political football. This is just a few cartoons. For those of you who know uh, French, this was from Plantu and Le Monde, showing you some of the, the thinking, the jokes about Muslims. Must be hard to be locked up. On finit par s'y faire. You get used to it. So you can see the cultural, look at the cultural images here, the cultural ideas. I mean, you could look at this and say this is sort of typical French <laughs> colonialism in some ways. A little bit of Islamophobia in this cartoon. I don't know if you find it funny or not. Ah, I like this picture. Look at the young girl. What about me? Don't I have some rights? Aitan, what are my rights? The French call it le droit à la différence. Le droit à la différence. I have a right to be different. Under the French system, the French mythology, it's this strong republican mythology. Once you become French, you give up all of those habits and customs. You should not display your religious convictions in public. Well, obviously this, this young girl, she's asking, what about fraternité? Liberté, égalité, fraternité? Why not me? Why can't I be treated? Like, and be who I am. This is a very incendiary book written by a German economist named Thilo. Interesting that his name is Saracen. Saracen. <laughs> um, a very Islamophobic book. Germany is doing away with itself. Germany must stop immigration from coming in. These are all examples of reactive populism. Undermining the liberal idea, the liberal consensus. This, of course, is my president. And he, he, did, he did say all of these things. Marco, this, I always, he reminds me of Mussolini somehow. <laughs> the expressions. But again, authoritarian, populist, radical. We have to stop Muslims, stop the refugees from coming into our country. They are very, very dangerous people. Does anyone in here know, think a statistic, what is the probability of being killed by a refugee in America? Does anyone know what the probability is? It is one, one in 3.3 billion. One in 3.3 billion. <laughs> much more dangerous crossing the street <laughs> than having refugees. But you can see how powerful the ideas, how powerful the politics is here. About 47, 48 percent of my fellow citizens voted for him for president. And of course, keeping the Mexicans out. The Mexicans are uh, rapists, murderers, criminals and we must build a wall to keep them from coming in. Tomorrow I will talk about US and Mexico more specifically. But one little thing to remember is the Mexicans are going home <laughs> in large numbers. The flows are reversed now. The net migration is it's negative. So why are we building a wall? What's the purpose of this wall? It is a purely political symbol to get to gain votes. It has no meaning. Another one of my favorite populists. Uh, his daughter, of course, ran for the presidency in France. This is Jean-Marie Le Pen. La France aux Français. Être Français, cela se mérite. France should be kept for the French people. Le Pen said, a quote from Le Pen, he said, I love the Arabs long as they stay in their own country. Don't come here, stay there. And of course we know he was famous as a soldier in the Algerian war for participating in the torture of the Algerian prisoners. He was very proud of that, bragging about that as a candidate. 
This is uh, a poster from the German uh, Nazi party, the neo-Nazi party, in PD. Ausländer raus, Kriminelle, Ausländer raus. Get the criminal foreigners out of our country. So this is the kind of discourse, the kind of politics that we're seeing. But here, Aitan, here is the silver lining, the optimistic view. Rights are still extremely important. And we can, we can have a debate about this. They are very important because they are deeply institutionalized. Who does Trump hate most? <laughs> he hates the judges. These judges. They are stopping the policy. Intervening, stopping his policies. How can a judge do that? Well, people have rights. Rights have a very long half-life. You cannot simply, in a liberal democracy, you can't simply say we take away all the rights. At least not yet. They are both domestically, internationally, institutionalized through the U.S. Constitution, uh, the Refugee Convention, and so forth. And they are protected by courts. We heard a brilliant exposition earlier on the European Court of Human Rights and its decisions about the rights of migrants. And of course, we still have a very high demand for high-skilled and low-skilled labor. And this is true not just in America, it's true in Asia as well. The centrality of rights, rights, rights are the key. Look at, Australia is pretty good. They have a very strong package of rights. If you can get, if you can get in, <laughs> The rights are pretty good. You have to get there. <laughs> uh, Canada, look at Sweden. We, Sweden took more refugees than Germany as a proportion of the population. I don't know how many of you, uh, there's a book about rights called uh, The Price of Rights. Anyone in here has read this book? Very important book, it's called The Price of Rights. It's written by an Austrian economist named Martin Ruse. And in this book, any economists in here? Am I the only person trained in e economics in here? Do any of you know any economists? <laughs> economists are very clever people. And Etan, you can put a price on anything. Everything has a price. Even rights have a price. And my friend Martin Ruse, he just moved to the European University Institute in Florence where Charles studied at one point. He said there's a trade-off. A trade-off, a price. If you give rights, you cannot have immigrants. If you take the migrants, you must take them as workers, as commodities, but don't give them rights. That's the argument. Think about it. That's the price of rights. But there are some problems for Martin's analysis. One problem is Sweden, which is a, a state that gives lots of rights to migrants. If anyone has been to Sweden in here, I was just recently in Sweden. When you arrive as an asylum seeker in Sweden, did you know this, Marco? You get a number, a card, and it entitles you to whatever you need <laughs> to begin to make a new life for yourself. That's how the Swedes do it. And the Swedes took a lot of refugees. Now you can say, well, this was a dangerous thing for Sweden to do. Politically, it was very risky. Aitan, what's going on here? <laughs> maybe, maybe Turkey is doing better. I think the Turks are giving rights to the Syrians. Erdogan invited them to become citizens, right? Didn't he? I don't know. We can discuss this. Uh, the U.S. is not so bad. But this is the MIPEX score, which looks at rights. And you can see, I don't know, where would, where would Brazil be on this? Uh, would Brazil, I don't know. 
we should look for the MIPEC score. Maybe this would be a good assignment to find the MIPEC score for, sweet, for Brazil. Finally, and I know we're running out of time, but I just want to uh, leave you with a few thoughts about migration interdependence, and I think I will not spend a lot of time on this because we're going to talk more about this tomorrow, but migration is driving interdependence even more than trade or investment. It is linking societies and economies together. The question is how will this process be managed? I'm going to skip over this because I want to come back to it tomorrow, but many states today are in transition. I assume Brazil is also in transition from becoming a state of out-migration to a state of in-migration. Um, Oh, that was not supposed to be on there. Sorry about that. I don't know. Maybe I put up the wrong uh, slide. But uh, I think I should probably stop there. And I'm going, I will leave you, for those of you who are uh, working in UNHCR, uh, I will talk more about this tomorrow. But what are the prospects for building more international cooperation? an international regime for migration, this is a big question. It's a big question. And um, I'm going to leave that lecture for tomorrow. So I hope some of you will be able to come back tomorrow and we will talk about the problems of building international cooperation and international regimes on migration. The weakest regimes are for people, for labor, the stronger regimes obviously for trade and for finance. So I think, Charles, is that good? I stop there and I am happy to entertain your questions. I bet you have no questions at all about this lecture. Thank you very much. Um. Vamos abrir para a primeira rodada de perguntas. Hi, professor. Thank you for your lecture. Okay. It was very interesting. Um, uh, I am a volunteer in an ONG here in Brazil, mm -hmm. and we are dealing a lot of with Syrian refugee in uh -huh. Sao Paulo, okay? Mm -hmm. And my question is, uh, when you said about the dimensions of the game, yeah. one of the dimensions is culture, yeah. and one of the levels you play it, it's the acceptance of the society regarding this cultural... Especially in the local level. Yes, yeah. exactly. And that's one of the problems we imagine we're going to have here, yeah. uh, uh, because we are receiving Muslim people, yeah. and our schools, for example, yeah. our children and our teenagers are not used mm. to see w women with hijab. <laughs> or, and I think this will become a discussion here in Brazil. Mm -hmm. And when you say, uh, you're discussing now in USA, are we going to give them rights or not? Mm -hmm. But at the same time you were discussing it, the government is always making a speech uh, regarding Muslims saying they are not good, yep. their culture yep. is not good. Yep. So this is very dangerous because yep. even though you end up yep. giving them rights, yep. you have a whole construction yep. of a speech yep. Yep. that yep. probably those rights won't be enough to make them be accepted yep. in the society. Yep. And I want you to talk about uh, this a little bit more because yep. I think sure. it's problem. Okay, thank you. Well, these, uh, should I answer each question or take a few questions? Uh, three, round of three questions. Who's next? Who is next? Yeah. Hello, Professor. So, I'm a student of international relations, so I'll mobilize some uh, concepts of international relations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I will start with interdependence. Like you said that migration leads to interdependence between states, dependence between the states, they link the economies yeah. and certain yeah. things. Yeah. But if you take to the realistic thought yeah. of international politics, you're going to see very clear 
that uh, dependence sometimes leads to bad things yeah. instead of leading to good things. Yeah. So like uh, the Second World War before the First yeah. World War also, Germany and England had a very complementary economy. Yeah. They were yeah. economic yeah. partners yeah. and they also fought for war. Yeah. So thinking that dependence should lead to good things, yeah. uh, I guess is... Well, uh, that's, that's a great question. It's a very challenging question. And uh, I get okay. a... a mm -hmm. Some a second, second comment. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you have opposed politics to economics. Mm -hmm. So uh, you said up something about the Marxist thought, but I, I kind of reclaim this. Uh, like politics and economies, sometimes principle. Uh, uh, my view of things, of course, <laughs> and who and I. Uh, but like comparing uh, the, the the things, for example, there is a lot of economic. I'm sorry. There is a lot of studies that links the immigrants to economics and their mm -hmm. yeah. the shift in their politics uh -huh. of the states to help companies to get with employers. Yeah. So sometimes uh, politics and giving rights to people mm -hmm. does not oppose exactly to economy, yeah. but sometimes politics and economy are linked. Yeah. Uh, so, and my last comment, I'm, mm -hmm. I promise mm -hmm. I'm finishing, mm -hmm. is that um, you talk about Brazil is becoming a uh, I immigrant mean, state, so like we only hold like immigrant states, like something, is that right? I'm sorry? Uh, that Brazil is becoming a migrant state, yeah. uh, so, but we only hold 10,000 refugees, yeah. and uh, with these refugees uh, we had a kind of problem, yeah. so we have a lot of institutional failure yeah. uh, to help them to get into something. So I'm kind of thinking, how is this possible? I'm sorry, I just want to know how is this? I think we need to have a seminar here <laughs> to discuss all of these things. I'll try to, I'll try to remember the, uh, the questions, but hopefully I can address most of them. We'll take one, one last... Uh, so many questions, okay. Well, um, I go back to, to your question. Um, I don't think there's any, any question that when you look at human behavior, uh, the, the cultural dynamic is very, very strong. It's very powerful. And, um, but then what is culture? <laughs> Are there any anthropologists in here? Uh, economists usually don't think about culture. You can't measure it. You can't measure it. Uh, I had a, one of my professors who said, it's just racial, racial thinking, you know, culture. But it is incredibly powerful in human behavior. Uh, and I, someone mentioned Levi-Strauss, uh, uh, I think it might have been Gabriel talking about Claude Lévi-Strauss, you know, go back and read the, the French anthropologist about the other, you know, the worry about the other. So, I'm not sure I can fully address your, your question about what, what to do, you know, when you're receiving a, lots of people from a different culture. Most of the research on this that I'm familiar with there's a, a very strong hypothesis called the contact hypothesis. Do any of you know this argument? It's very, lots of evidence from psychology and social psychology. The more you know the migrants, the immigrants, the less fearful you are of them. I mean, that's just a fact. So the people who are most frightened <laughs> are the ones who are on the periphery on the outside looking in. They're looking from some at Rio or Sao Paulo and they're saying, oh, we should never allow this to happen. Not in my neighborhood, not in my community. In the US it's very, very clear. The people who are farthest away from the migrants, they listen to Trump. <laughs> uh, so some of it is familiarity. That would be one answer to your question. Um, and of course I go back to my point about having a strong national <laughs> idea, a strong national culture. I have to apologize, I don't know much about Brazil. 
But m what, I, what little I know about Brazil, Brazil is a bit like Canada, multicultural, multiracial, it's supposed to be a society that doesn't fear difference or the other, at least that's what I was always told. Um, now you, you look like you look like some of my Canadian friends. When I say this to the Canadians, they're like, who, us? You know, we're terrible. The Canadians are not very good. So I don't know. I mean, I, I really would love to hear from some of you what is the Brazilian idea? Because you have to have some idea to assimilate, to integrate these people. Uh, the French have an idea. Unfortunately, the French idea is a very colonial, imperialistic idea that you must become like us. There's no option but to become French. In in Brazil, it's a racial de racial democracy. Okay, I will I will take this I will take this idea back. Yeah. But so this just final point about this. This is the big challenge. That's why I stopped and talked a little bit about integration. Uh, because you don't have to be a genius <laughs> to understand that when you accept large numbers of people coming from other cultures and other societies, there will be a challenge of integrating those people into your society. And some societies are stronger at doing this than others. I do think Canada is pretty good. But Canada adopted this multicultural idea. We could talk about this. Germany had lots of problems. The Germans couldn't really figure out what to do, how to do this. Uh, and you can compare society. So look at Brazil. Um, Brazil is a very Christian society, a very Catholic society. I don't know if that will influence the thinking, the ideas about Muslims or is people coming from other cultures. Um, the Muslim population in the United States is actually fairly small. I think maybe five or six million, something like that, which is very small by American standards. And I don't think any minority, any group has been more successful <laughs> in integrating into American society and economy than, than Muslims. They have been very successful, very good. Uh, in part because we got highly, highly educated people <laughs> from across the Muslim world. Doctors, lawyers, engineers. They integrated in the top of society. Very different in Europe. <laughs> you know, those Turkish workers did not have PhDs, <laughs> you know. So it was harder on class terms to, to integrate many of these people. Okay, this young man here, your questions, um, and I do think we have to have a separate conversation probably about this, but, and I, I think I will beg for, are you coming back tomorrow for the lecture tomorrow? <laughs> so you can't be here tomorrow, too bad. Because you know, I'm going to talk a lot about this issue of cooperation, but you made, you made one very important point, uh, and that is, about interdependence of societies and economies. Britain and Germany were very interdependent. I'm trying to remember the name of the historian who wrote a book about 1900 and he said no more no more war because our societies our economies are linked together. Interdependence stops conflict and war. It only leads to cooperation, to peace. This is in 1900. So what happens 14 years later? The most destructive, horrible, bloody war in history, the First World War. So simply taking the liberal idea that interdependence leads to peace, uh, I think Gabriel must be gone now, but it's what I call the Kantian, <laughs> you know, the Kantian dream. Kant was the first great theorist of interdependence. 
And, you know, he wrote Perpetual Peace in 1795. What an optimist. <laughs> Do you know what Europe looked like in 1795? <laughs> this is the year, of, when was the terror? The terror was, I think, in 1795. <laughs> How can you look at Robespierre and see anything positive here? <laughs> but Kant, sitting in his study in, in Königsberg, you know, oh, way out there in Ostpreußen Ost in East Prussia, he had this idea, you know, hospitality, trade, these things will promote peace, peaceful relations. And if you go back and you read Perpetual Peace, he actually had a blueprint, you know, for an international organization, Marco, that would lead to cooperation, greater peace. I forgot what he, what did he call it? It was a league, I think he called it a league, right? Hmm? League of the People. Basically, he had a blueprint for what would become the United Nations <laughs> in 1795. <laughs> so, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm very much a Kantian. You know, I still subscribe to the basic precepts of Kantian liberalism. The, the political theorist here can correct me on my reading of Kant. But So, I will say one final thing about this, and that is if we do not have cooperation, if we do not strive to create a more a freer and more open world, we will have conflict. <laughs> the policies of Donald Trump will lead to conflict. They probably will lead to war if they are not checked. So this is very serious, very dangerous when one nation says, I don't care what the other nations are doing. In English we have an expression, my way or the highway. <laughs> we do it my way. I assert my sovereignty. And if all the nations take this position, where, where does that leave us? So, after the Second World War, there was a complete change of thinking that we need to build international organizations, international cooperation. That's what I was starting to say at the end of my lecture. So I will come back to this tomorrow. This will be the subject of my lecture. I think these are all online, right? So you will be able to watch it. I don't know if I gave you a card, but we can, we can continue to have this discussion. But th that's a very, very interesting question. Do we have any time for more questions or? Yeah. Uh, this lady here, then Marco, and then you. So let's, let's take your question. Um, when you say about um, where Brazil, um, how, <laughs> what's the myth? What is yeah. the Brazilian myth or yes. whatever? Uh, well, um, that's a big question for us now because mm -hmm. I think, uh, like many other countries in the world, we were, we took it for granted that we had a democracy, yeah. and yeah. Um, as in other countries, we are yeah. discovering. Uh, yeah. recently that uh, that was not the case. And yeah, in the United States too, by the way. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, this is big news. And um, so, but of course, different from, of course, from the United States that had even a place like the United States who, who did have a democracy yep. more consolidated than we had. Yep. We had a yep. very young one. Yeah, I know, I know. And, uh, I was just being so flippant. <laughs> no, no, yes, but uh, just yeah. to have a, a dimension yeah. that when you don't have it, you know, it's even more... Uh, so, uh, what, what I want to say is like, we are in a moment of um, where your pink glasses, our pink glasses are taking out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we are discovering a society that yep. we thought we used to look at yep. in a very pink way yep. for yep. the others yep. around us. And we are discovering ourselves yep. as racist, yep. uh, yep. uh, um, classist, and uh, a lot of exploitation. Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, These so feelings are always there. They're always there in every society. They're always there. Yeah, yep. yeah mm -hmm. but like... Yeah. Uh, Brazilian, I don't think, I don't see Brazil as having mm -hmm. a myth about them. They, 
we no. don't. Yeah. I don't think that we uh, we really know. At the, at the moment, we are yeah. very busy fighting <laughs> for our own democracy. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and so when yeah. uh, on when the um, immigrants of, uh, of refugees arrive here, yeah. they are just going to uh, to to join us yeah. in this in this. Yeah. Well, I this you know I just to inter interject one thing here. Um, my wife came with me on this trip the first time. She, for many years, she wanted to visit Brazil. She has this incredible positive image about Brazil. My wife is from Japan. Japan. So she thinks, I must go meet my Brazilian Japanese cousins here. <laughs> Because they seem to have uh, they seem to have done pretty well here. The Japanese, do. I don't know, a lot of Brazilian Japanese. So, you do have a history here of uh, accepting and integrating people from other cultures, other societies. So, um, I'm not sure my wife has found enough Brazilian Japanese yet to make a judgment. But uh, so I just wanted to interject there. Yeah. But I want to introduce yeah. her to many. Yeah. Many <laughs> Japanese friends, which, which you might like to know. And you know the Brazilian, you know the Brazilian Japanese. You remember they were recruited to come back to work in Japan, but they were very unhappy in Japan because they didn't feel at they home, and they were treated very badly <laughs> by the Japanese. Yeah, yeah they don't fit right. there yeah. either anymore. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, so. Um, what I want to say. Okay. Th we probably should go quickly because we're, yeah, we're almost out of time. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, but I, I see your point about the Brazilian myth. You know, should we let Marco ask the question? Yeah. He's behind you. Uh, yeah, thank Marco. you. Very briefly, since you mentioned the Dublin uh, system, asking about it, of course it's a disaster on all fronts, <laughs> yeah. a humanitarian, uh, uh, financial, uh, yeah, yeah, logistic, yeah. and yeah. all of that. Yeah. And despite like uh, there are uh, attempt to change it, there's still the core principle of pushing the burden on, on frontiers which are yeah. outside yeah. the core of yeah. Europe. Yeah. And I want to mention another thing, like the, the reason for enlarging Europe in different ways always was bringing with yeah. some other political, geopolitical um, implication, one of which of the last enlargement, the future ones, uh -huh. is to push the boundaries out from Germany down back to Turkey. And that's, yeah. So yeah. that's another way of pushing. Well, yeah, this is the, the extraterritorialization that Aitan spoke yeah. so well about. I mean, if you can push the border back, the boundary back, there's some pr something sacred about the territory of the liberal state. If you put your foot on that territory, all kinds of rights begin. So you can understand why people are desperate just to touch the, mm. to touch the territory. Um, and of course in Europe, the territory includes the members mm. of, the, of the EU. Uh, but we now found out that that, those, that territory, those rights, are, they're not infinite. Mm. Uh, but I was saying good things about the Germans and I said some good things about Italy too. I know the Italians have some, you know, they are on the front line. Uh, but I think Mare Nostrum was a pretty yeah, it was a good serious point. attempt to try to yeah. cope with a humanitar humanitarian catastrophe, mm -hmm. humanitarian disaster. So, yeah. maybe tomorrow we talk more about the EU. There was one more question. No, I, I, have, I have a small question, okay. though, okay. because you mentioned, and, and this fantastic, uh, uh, even visualization, uh, visualization of the politics of migration, mm -hmm. how much, though, the, um, the economic uh, yeah. um, theme of maintaining people illegal to exploit them in the labor market plays a role in determining migration policies, you know, like the daughter of Ch Noam Chomsky, Aviva Chomsky, they wrote, she wrote a book called Undocumented, How Migrants Became Illegal, where the central argument is basically is that benefits uh, all level yep. of society yep. Yep. to control the, the yep. frontier and make people as more illegal as possible so they get lower wages, they're yep. more vulnerable, yep. and so, so how much in that model the market area 
would uh, kind of prevail uh, mm -hmm. somehow in, in, in that context of the other elements of the model? Well, if, if it prevails. I mean, that's, that's, the French would say, c'est la question à mille francs. <laughs> you know, it's a $64,000 question. Um, but that's the, you know, the, 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 the political economic dynamic we see in all these societies. How do you balance you know, the, the needs of the economy and you know, the needs of society uh, and having a stable, flourishing democracy? Uh, this is a very, very difficult thing to do. Uh, but I would not underestimate you know, the power of markets. I mean, I do think the liberals are right. Markets can do amazing things if you, if you let them work. Uh, but of course, many politicians are not prepared to do that. So, uh, but Italy, it's amazing how many migrants, refugees, foreigners are finding their place in Italian economy and Italian society. It's it's a process. Uh, it's certainly not a smooth process. Um, but, you know, I remain optimistic that both Italy and the United States will solve these problems of these enormous informal labor markets, black labor markets, which you know, obviously help the economy in many ways, but they are hurting the society and hurting the migrants. Uh, so, you know, that is where we are now in terms of these dilemmas. I do give the Italians credit. They are not afraid of amnesty. <laughs> you know, the Italians, the Spaniards, the Sp Spain is an amazing country. Spain has done also in incredible things. Uh, finding a space, giving amnesty, creating rights for migrants. You know, I was in Morocco several times recently. There are something like 40 or 50,000 sub-Saharan Africans now who are being allowed to stay and work in Morocco. So Morocco is making these choices. Uh, Mexico now, of course, faces the issue of the southern border and the Central Americans and so forth and so on. So these are all, as you said, the front line, the, the border states, the border societies, and the pressures there are enormous. I think we had one last question. To ask tomorrow, okay. Uh, so I think we probably uh, reached the end. So thank you very much for your attention at the end of this long day. Thank you.